I'm Jack Marlowe, and I've been the local cop in Cedarville, Idaho, for more than a decade. It's a quiet town surrounded by dense forests and sprawling meadows. Most days, my most exciting encounters are bear sightings and speeding teenagers. However, something happened recently that shook this town to its core. A gloomy morning greeted my arrival at work. A brief conversation with the dispatcher informed me of an urgent situation. Two people had gone missing from their homes during the night. As I gathered my coat and weapons, I couldn't help but think about my daughter Sarah. She's the only family I've got ever since her mother passed away last year. Arriving at the first residence, I was met by an older distressed woman, Mrs. Stevenson. Her husband had vanished without any indication. Continuing to the next house, another bewildered spouse had lost her husband during the night. The usual investigation procedures didn't yield any suspects or leads. Nevertheless, rumors started to spread throughout Cedarville that something sinister lurked just beyond our reach. Days later, I stumbled upon a gut-wrenching scene while patrolling near Cedar Cove Lake. Mutilated remains of three people scattered in chaos. The coroner could hardly identify them due to the horrific dismemberment. From that moment on, fear gripped our little town like a vice. People stayed indoors after sunset, and armed militias formed to hunt what they believed was the cause. This yet-to-be-identified creature was disrupting our lives in Cedarville. After weeks of unrest, more people went missing, each time as mystifying as before. It took me stumbling upon another gruesome scene to realize this was beyond anything we'd ever experienced. Upon closer investigation of that gory sight, I noticed muddy trails leading to a cave near Cedar Cove Lake. It hadn't garnered much attention previously because of its elusive nature and tortuous passages. Entering the cave alone, while slowly advancing with my flashlight, I discovered what appeared to be nests and piles of bones. The smell was unbearable and deeply unsettling. Each crunching step echoed throughout the cavern. As I delved deeper into the cave, I heard whisper-like movements behind me. Spun around with my gun and flashlight drawn, nothing caught my eye initially. Then, with every flash reflecting from the walls of the narrow passage, a glimpse of something monstrous and grotesque emerged. It was tall, comprised mostly of muscles and covered in filthy black hair, wrapped around its body like tangled vines. The creature's eyes were entirely white, void of any discernible pupils. I knew better than to fire upon this monstrosity myself. Bravado could only get me and Cedarville killed, clutching my sidearm tightly as adrenaline surged through my body. As I began a slow backwards retreat towards the cave entrance, my disbelief fought against the undeniable reality before me. The creature seemed not to notice my presence, or perhaps it just didn't care. My priority was getting back to Cedarville to warn everyone. They needed to know about the true nature of the monster that was terrorizing the town. I had no plan, but preferable to staying in the cave and confronting the creature in its lair, so I inched away from it, doing my best to remain undiscovered. Once I exited the cave, I ran through Cedar Cove Lake as fast as my legs would take me, desperate to reach safety. There was no time for doubts or questions— only a desire for survival and an inexplicable urge to share my chilling discovery with those who could help. I arrived home, breathless but relieved. As soon as I stepped inside, I grabbed my phone with trembling hands and dialed 911. Cedarville had a small police force, but perhaps they'd have some ideas on how to deal with such a terrible predator. 911, what's your emergency? The voice on the other end sounded calm and collected, a stark contrast to my panicked state. I, I found something terrible in a cave near Cedar Cove Lake. 
There's a monstrous creature responsible for the missing people in Cedarville. You have to send help. My voice cracked as I spoke, trying hard not to cry. There was a pause before the response came. Sir, please remain calm. Are you currently in any danger? No, no. The creature's still hiding in its cave as far as I know, but we need help. Police officers soon arrived at my house, after which I explained everything about my horrifying encounter and took them back to the cave where it all happened. Armed and cautiously approaching the entrance of the cave, we quickly found ourselves surrounded by the same unsettling scene from before, nests filled with bones painting an ominous picture of what lay within. As we proceeded deeper into the cave, the officers and I began hearing odd, scratching noises growing louder. At one point, a sharp hiss echoed throughout the cavern. The officers tightened their grip on their weapons as we prepared to confront the beast once and for all. However, reality didn't unfold as expected. It rarely does with such horrors. We searched high and low throughout the cave but found nothing more than nests and bones. The creature had disappeared, at least for now. Feeling defeated after hours exploring the cave in vain, we eventually exited into the cold night air. Whatever had been inside was now long gone. This horrible menace remained at large, and it was up to the brave people of Cedarville to come up with a solution. After exhaustive town meetings and discussions with local authorities, it was clear that the creature wouldn't be easily found or defeated. A patrol team was formed with officers trained to respond quickly to any potential attacks or sightings of the beast. Citizens were urged to stay in groups and avoid traveling alone when possible. We did this hoping that our unified stance would strengthen us against an enemy that seemed almost unstoppable. Day by day, the people of Cedarville adapted to a new way of living, constantly vigilant against an unseen monster that could strike without warning. Every so often, someone would report strange thuds or whispers in the night but no further fatalities occurred. It almost felt like the creature was watching us from afar, waiting. Months passed like this until one fateful day when we found signs that the creature may have moved on from our town, tracks leading away from Cedar Cove Lake after a bout of heavy rainfall. With great relief and hesitance, we decided to cautiously resume our lives as they were before. The townspeople organized a memorial service for those who'd fallen victim to our unseen foe. The event featured somber speeches about loss and perseverance. Family and friends gathered to remember their loved ones who were taken far too soon. It was a chilling reminder that the creature had left its terrible mark on Cedarville, and on all of us. Slowly but surely, Cedarville began to heal from this terrible ordeal. Almost all signs of the monster's existence vanished like a nightmare after waking up and although the town never discovered its origin or nature, we were grateful for its disappearance. Today, I can't help but still cast an apprehensive glance over my shoulder whenever I'm near Cedar Cove Lake. A dread within me lurks that our tormentor might return one day. I clutched my car keys tightly in one hand while fumbling with my uniform in the other. You'd think after twenty years of wearing this police uniform, I'd have this routine down. I muttered to myself. Growing up in Tiny Howell, Oregon meant that unexpected crimes were a rarity. Most days were spent helping folks with mundane tasks, like changing flat tires or assisting with locked doors. My wife... Atia Faller chuckled from the kitchen. Just make sure you come back in one piece, okay? You know how you get when you're out chasing something. I flashed her a smirk. Yeah, I'll be home even before the kids wake up for school. As I drove to the station, the full moon cast a brilliant glow on the empty streets. 
Little did I know that tonight would be unlike any other night in hell. At the police station, my partner, Copland Graymont, greeted me with grave urgency. Chief called for backup at the riverfront. Reports of missing person and possible murder. Copland was rarely this serious, so we sprinted to our patrol car and peeled out towards the reported crime scene. Chief Marcel Tobin was barely visible through the dense fog that hung over the riverfront when we arrived. About time you got here, he barked. We found old man Calvert's boat abandoned down by the pier. A pool of blood and some torn clothing nearby. The fear was written all over Chief Tobin's face as he described what was found nearby. It seemed as if this was a case Howell was ill-equipped to handle. I've never seen anything like it, Copland whispered as we examined the site where Mr. Calvert had last been seen. I swallowed hard before responding. Neither have I. We searched for any signs of life or an attacker thoroughly but found nothing beyond fresh claw marks, unknown to us. Chief Tobin looked at me, scouring for any answers. I don't know, Chief. I'm no expert. But those claw marks, something not from around here caused them. The quietness of the town was shattered by a blood-curdling scream from the direction of Howell's community center. Struggling to contain our mounting dread, we raced back to the patrol car, sirens blaring and hearts pounding. As we burst through the doors of the bustling community center, I spotted the hysterical Hannah Anwala frantically pacing near her sobbing children. My husband, she choked out. He's, he's gone. We were cleaning up after tonight's event and just gone. My mind raced with fear for Howell's residence. Yet something deep inside urged me to piece together these bizarre occurrences. Chief Tobin barked new orders to secure the perimeter. Both of you go find whoever, or whatever, did this. We searched exhaustively throughout the night, Copland silently by my side, but found nothing. By dawn, a new sense of unease gripped Howell as news of these horrific events spread swiftly. Over the next several days, more fearful reports poured in from citizens claiming that people were being targeted and brutally attacked. The once friendly small town began sinking into an abyss of paranoia and terror as they demanded action be taken against this faceless terror. We'd reached our breaking point when another call for help cut through the airwaves, our dispatcher's voice trembling with fear. Code 3. There's been another murder. Our hearts sank with defeat as we approached another grisly scene one more missing person torn from their life by an unknown assailant who left no clues behind save for vicious claw marks. I stood there staring blankly at what used to be someone's peaceful life as Chief Tobin pulled me aside, his voice resigned. Look, we just don't have the manpower to keep up with this. I'm calling in some additional help. It wasn't long before outside investigators flooded Howell. But as more gruesome cases surfaced, our best resources seemed powerless against that which couldn't be explained. In the darkest hours, whispers of a fearsome creature infiltrating our once peaceful town resonated through Howell's collective consciousness. The residents desperately clung to the idea that this primal force of destruction could be stopped. As each day passed, the terror grew stronger and the townspeople's eyes were filled with fear. The investigators worked tirelessly, trying to piece together any clues that might lead them to the creature responsible for these heinous crimes. I, too, was feeling helpless. I wanted to be of some assistance, but I knew I couldn't confront or investigate this menacing thing without risking my life. The situation escalated quickly. Night after night, We'd hear frantic screams echoing throughout Howell, evidence that the creature had claimed another victim. There were moments where I considered calling for help but kept silent out of fear that I might draw attention to myself and become the next target. 
For the sake of thoroughness and searching for answers, some investigators started amassing details about possible suspects, including a local man named John Murphy who had been recently discharged from a mental institution. Investigators found him pacing through town muttering incoherently and smiling at gruesome crime scenes. However, after following Murphy and eliminating him as a suspect, the sheer brutality of subsequent murders left officers with no doubt that they were dealing with something far worse than human malice. As more victims fell prey to the abomination stalking our streets, a clearer picture of its grotesque appearance emerged. Witness testimonies described an alarming beast that stood at least seven feet tall on lean but formidable limbs. Its mottled skin appeared scaly and leathery, while its grotesquely elongated fingers were tipped with razor-sharp talons unique to any known predator. Its most chilling feature was its face, or rather, the lack of one. The creature did not have any recognizable facial features just a cavernous hole filled with sharp teeth behind which lurked a visceral darkness. More than just its physical attributes, though, it was how the creature hunted that terrified us all, waiting patiently before striking its prey with surgical precision, no mercy in sight nor evident motive for its bloodlust. The final confrontation took place shortly after the creature attacked my neighbor's family. Linda, her husband, and their three children were slaughtered mere feet from where I cowered in my own home, too paralyzed by fear to move or cry for help. A group of investigators managed to corner the beast in the woods on the outskirts of town. With heavy hearts and trembling hands, they confronted the horror that had caused so much anguish. Amidst the din of gunfire and anguished screams, some asked themselves if this would be their last battle before falling to the ground lifeless. But in the end, they succeeded at defeating the monstrous creature. Its body lay sprawled across the dirt-covered leaves, having finally succumbed to numerous gunshot wounds. As we mourned those who perished at its hands, we gathered around its carcass trying to discern any clue about its origins, but we found none. Whatever species it belonged to remained a mystery just as unknown and terrifying as it had been hiding among us. With time, normalcy slowly returned to our lives. Shadows held fewer terrors. Nightmares became less frequent. However, as we live through our days forever changed by these events, we will never forget those who had been taken from us. Their memory is etched into our collective heart, indelible marks left by this harrowing ordeal. Today I stand here thankful that terror has ceased to grip Howell streets but burdened by questions that may never be answered. In quiet moments, I feel lingering doubts and wonder if there are more like this creature waiting in hidden corners of the world, a sinister presence that could shatter our illusion of safety at any moment. In honor of those we have lost and as a reminder to stay vigilant against mysterious evils lurking in the shadows, we must remain mindful of this dark chapter in what is otherwise a quaint storybook small town living with a newly minted fear. It was one of those nights when you can't help but feel exhausted, both mentally and physically. I'm Officer Darren McKellen a small town cop in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. This place has always been my home, and I grew up knowing everyone in town. Pine Ridge is a quiet town, nestled at the edge of the picturesque Black Hills National Forest. The place is known for its stunning views, dense forests, and cozy little neighborhoods that make it feel more like a village than a town. Most days are uneventful here, except for today. I was patrolling the outskirts of Pine Ridge when dispatch informed me of some strange reports in the Whispering Pines campsite. Campers had spotted bloodstains on the trails and torn clothing hanging from the trees though no screams had been heard. Despite feeling skeptical, 
I headed towards the campsite to check out the situation. Entering Whispering Pines was like stepping into a different world. A blanket of darkness enveloped the area with only my headlights piercing through it. The gravel crackled beneath my tires as I slowly navigated the narrow roads that led to the crime scene. Once there, I met with a group of terrified campers who were huddled together anxiously chatting among themselves. The scene looked straight out of a crime show, blood splatters smeared across rocks and leaves with no clear trail leading anywhere. Broken branches hinted at frantic movement before everything went quiet. With no immediate explanation, I gathered statements and assured everyone that help was on its way. Backup could take hours, but if there was indeed something dangerous lurking nearby, waiting around in fear wouldn't be useful. As we searched deeper in the woods for any sign of what happened or who might be responsible, I started noticing large claw marks etched into trees as if something enormous and Claude had been tracking through these parts. The more we surveyed, the heavier my chest grew with each step. The unknown rarely entered Pine Ridge, and the thought of something sinister hiding within the shadows engulfed me. Tension spread like wildfire through the group as we edged further into the woods, the gnarled twigs and branches illuminated only by our flashlights. The stress was palpable in every whispered conversation, gasps escaping from our clenched jaws as we heard distant rustling in the underbrush. Halfway through our search, one member of our group stumbled upon a patch of displaced dirt fringes covered with unusual tufts of hair and sinew. Stepping closer cautiously, I couldn't shake off this intense feeling of being watched, not realizing then how horrific things would become for me and those around. With growing concern gnawing at my insides, I reconnected with my fellow Pine Ridgers and guided them back towards safety in hopes that backup would arrive sooner than anticipated. The air was tense. Something weighed heavily on all our minds as chatter ceased that terrible uncertainty sank its claws deeper into us. We continued walking, anxiously scanning our surroundings for any indication of where the danger might be hiding. As we ventured deeper into the unknown, we decided to call for help. I pulled out my phone and dialed 911, briefly explaining this situation to the operator who assured us that a team was on its way. Before long, we heard horrifying sounds echoing throughout the woods. We decided to take shelter in a nearby cave, hoping that whatever creature was responsible would pass by without noticing U.S. As we squatted down in our dismal hideout, I could see enormous footprints leading towards the cave entrance. Minutes turned to hours, and the group huddled together in quiet apprehension. Without warning, a figure appeared at the entrance of the cave, a massive beast with dark fur covering its muscular body and elongated limbs ending in razor-sharp claws. Its eyes pierced through the darkness with an eerie, unnatural glow. The creature began to approach us, slowly and methodically stalking each member of our group as panic set in. In brutal succession, it tore apart several members of our party with its deadly talons. Their blood-soaked screams will forever haunt me. As I instinctively tried to shield a fallen friend, I noticed something peculiar about this beast— it didn't have any scars or injuries despite going toe-to-toe -to -toe with several well-prepared pine ridgers. In a split-second decision that went against every fiber of my being, I chose to make a run for it as the creature continued savaging those brave enough to face it head-on. Dodging branches and dense underbrush while racing blindly back towards town, I could hear gut-wrenching cries for help and bloodthirsty growls as the beast claimed each of its victims. With every painful thud of my feet hitting the ground and breath drawing sharply into my lungs, it felt like reality itself was unraveling around me. Eventually, I broke free from the woods and stumbled onto the main road. Spying the flashing lights of approaching police cars and emergency vehicles, I frantically waved them down 
my desperate cries growing weaker with every word that left my lips. As the police force mobilized and began their search for the creature, I sat shivering on a roadside embankment, unable to comprehend what had just happened. The sheriff tried his best to comfort me in the midst of this tumultuous affair, but I knew that nothing, not even vengeance, could erase the nightmare etched into my memories. In the following days, Pine Ridge mourned its losses. Many found it hard to believe that such a ferocious beast could have been living among us, unseen for so long. We paid tribute to those who had been brutally taken by this fearsome creature, our neighbors, friends, and family members whose lives were cruelly cut short in an unforgettable tragedy. The surviving members of our group clung to a quiet determination, vowing never to let something like this happen again and striving to protect our once peaceful town from any future horrors that might dwell within the shadows. As Pine Ridge slowly began to rebuild from its anguish-stricken state, we were reminded that even the most seemingly impenetrable veil of tranquility can be shattered in a single instant. The memories of our fallen neighbors will forever serve as a testament not only to their bravery in the face of unimaginable terror but also as a stark reminder that stillness may only be a facade masking unspeakable horrors lurking just beneath the surface. I'm Officer Reed Fitzgerald, working in the quiet town of Silvertown, Pennsylvania. I remember it was lunch break at the station when my younger colleague, Davis Conroy, tried to mimic my mustache, a poor attempt at humor, but it broke the ice. The bond between us grew stronger ever since. One day, we got dispatched to investigate a missing person named Delbert Quinton an elderly man with a distinctive hooked nose and a hunched posture who had disappeared from his house without a trace. His worried wife had called us for help. We arrived at the Quinton residence and searched for clues. The only thing out of place was the tomato soup bubbling on the stove, as if Delbert had vanished mid-meal. Mrs. Quinton's face, creased with worry lines, desperately sought answers. I've contacted all our neighbors, but no one has seen him since this morning, she informed us anxiously. Davis and I canvassed the neighborhood but came up empty-handed. Our next move was to question Delbert's lifelong friend living on the edge of town, a fellow named Ira Higgins. As we approached Ira's house, we noticed scratch marks on his front door, as if someone or something had clawed at it aggressively. Those scratches are new, muttered Ira as he opened the door with suspicion etched on his face. After sharing Delbert's disappearance story with him, he looked genuinely concerned. I haven't seen him in days, said Ira while offering us some tea. We then noticed that even Ira's hand trembled slightly. Conversations with friends and family turned up no clue about Delbert's whereabouts. Weeks flew by without any sign of him. On a cold night, another call interrupted our investigation routine. Laura Himmelreich reported her husband missing after finding their bedroom window shattered and blood-stained curtains hanging by the jagged edge of broken glass. Davis and I raced to the scene, our urgency heightened by the chilling report. Laura, a petite woman with expressive eyes and dark brown hair, clung to their young daughter, both visibly frightened. We consoled and reassured them, then canvassed the entire house. Besides the shattered window, we also noticed footprints leading towards the dense woods behind their property. Grim determination set in as we geared up and ventured into the dark forest to find whatever it was that wreaked havoc in Silvertown. Strange noises and rustles accompanied our uneasy steps. Abandoned cabins and decaying structures revealed themselves among the trees, memories of a forgotten past concealed by shadows. A distant scream jerked us from our thoughts. 
We sprinted towards the sound, determined to save whoever or whatever was in danger. Each pounding footfall mirrored our racing hearts. Coming upon a forbidding clearing, we were dumbstruck by what we saw, a creature, humanoid with reptilian features, scales covering its entire body, and razor-sharp claws dripping with blood. It held the mauled lifeless body of Laura's husband. Davis raised his gun at the beast as it lunged forward toward us with unimaginable speed, its small opening wide to reveal a cavernous throat filled with rows upon rows of serrated teeth that could easily bite us in half. I yelled at Davis, Shoot it! He fired off several rounds at the creature, each bullet making an unsettling thud as they pierced its scaly hide. To our disbelief, the beast hardly flinched and continued barreling towards us. Regaining my composure, I yelled toward Laura's house. Laura! Call 911 right now! Tell them there's a dangerous animal attacking us! Time seemed to slow as we tried to fend off the monster's advances, hoping help would arrive soon. With no other choice, Davis and I retreated deeper into the woods while continuously firing our weapons at the creature with little effect. It was relentless. As we darted through the trees, we noticed the cave further in a temporary refuge, perhaps. We headed straight for it narrowly avoiding branches that whipped back at us. Upon reaching the cave entrance, we hurriedly threw ourselves inside before slumping to the cold floor. Panting and exhausted from our flight, we could still hear those unnerving sounds coming closer. The blood-curdling roars echoed through the cave as if mocking our fruitless attempts to escape. We scrambled deeper into the darkness until we discovered a narrow crevice that seemed impenetrable by its sheer size alone. Quickly maneuvering ourselves inside, we had no choice but to wait. And so we did weapons in hand and nerves frayed. At long last, after what felt like an eternity of echoes being replaced by silence, Davis cautiously made his way out of the crevice. Warily glancing around in all directions before signaling that it was safe for me to follow suit. It took several moments for our eyes to adjust to the gloom before realizing that help had finally arrived. A team of armed officers carefully approached us from outside the cave with their guns raised and ready. Their faces etched with disbelief upon seeing us alive amidst absolute mayhem. The body of Laura's husband was taken away, and paramedics tended to our minor injuries. Our superiors made a point to question us about exactly what had happened in those woods last night, and while we recounted the terrifying ordeal, we could sense their skepticism as the words left our lips. The creature had vanished as swiftly as it arrived, leaving nothing but a trail of destruction in its wake. Despite reinforcements scouring the area for any trace of it, no evidence was found to prove its existence or origin. I couldn't help but feel responsible for the death that night, for those shattered lives left behind in this tragedy. Whatever that creature was or wherever it came from must have been beyond us. The depths of the unknown are far more powerful and terrifying than anyone could comprehend. Laura had lost her husband that night, leaving her and their daughter to face life alone with only memories as cruel reminders of what transpired. As promised, Davis and I attended the funeral and walked alongside them on that solemn day each step heavier than the one before. Even years later, Silvertown seemed forever changed by those horrifying events. Whispers echoed through town with fingers pointing at researchers trying to unlock cryptic secrets around us secrets buried deep within our world never meant to be uncovered. Eventually, scars of another time faded into nothingness as Silvertown began its slow yet arduous healing process. In truth, I know we'll never find the creature again nor discern its origin one drenched in darkness wrapped in a veil of primordial cruelty unlike anything humanity has known. 
but I remain haunted by that fateful night when terror emerged from shadows with an unquenchable thirst for blood. I woke up after a restless night, tossing and turning over my past. Two years had gone by since I moved to Thompsonville, Pennsylvania. My name is Arthur Brackenridge, a small-town cop trying to escape my tarnished reputation in the city. Only a handful of people knew about it. It all began at work when we received a report of a missing person. Roy Cummings had vanished without a trace two days prior. A preliminary search proved futile though we suspected foul play, as remnants of blood were discovered near his property. Kathy Bobkins, another officer, joined the search party alongside me. This is baffling. I muttered as we combed through the dense woods bordering Thompsonville. No kidding, she replied. But we should remain focused. In our investigation, we discovered that some locals had gone missing under similar circumstances. After discussing among ourselves, we decided not to call for backup or outside help. We didn't want to attract unwanted attention or stir up fear. As days turned into weeks, we persevered in uncovering clues. One evening, after interviewing townsfolk for information on the ill-fated victims, Kathy handed me a handwritten map. I found something interesting, she whispered. All the missing people lived around this lake. Intrigued, I studied the map carefully. A grim pattern emerged that beckoned us to investigate further. The next day, Kathy and I ventured out to the lake under cover of darkness. On reaching its muddy banks, we felt an eerie presence lurking behind the silence. Suppressing our trepidation and aversion to this seemingly cursed place, we pushed forward with unwavering determination. Skirting the lake's edge revealed an inconspicuous path hidden by overgrown foliage. It led us through marshlands dotted with decomposed tree trunks and exposed roots that clawed at our ankles as if warning us to turn back. The path abruptly halted before a dilapidated house, hidden away amidst the crooked trees. This could hold the key to our missing person's case. I whispered, and we pushed open the creaky door. The interior was littered with decaying furniture, broken glass, and a foul stench that threatened to expel the contents of our stomachs. As we explored deeper into the abandoned house, we stumbled upon a room that seemed strangely untouched. Kathy's flashlight exposed scattered photographs on a table, revealing frightful images of horrified victims an unspeakable catalogue of torture and pain. The walls carried deep gouges as if made by inhuman claws. I don't like this, Arthur. It's like something otherworldly, Kathy whimpered. Suddenly, we heard heavy footsteps from outside. Sensing danger and cataclysmic desperation, we hid within the room, praying for our lives. A creature lumbered inside the house. I dared a peek through the narrow slit of our hiding spot. Never had I seen such a terrifying figure in my days as an officer. It stood on two legs like a human but appeared bloated and grotesque like an amphibious ghoul. It wielded vicious-looking appendages where arms should have been, sharp enough to shred flesh from bone with ease. I gripped my firearm tightly but remained immobile revealing ourselves could be their last mistake in life. We couldn't even warn others of our whereabouts as cell service remained elusive at that hour. Breathing heavily yet trying to stifle our cries of terror, I resolved my thoughts back to those hapless victims whose fates we were now acutely aware of. It no longer felt ludicrous to speculate that their bodies may have been grotesquely devoured by this creature. The creature moved slowly through the house, searching for something. Kathy and I remained hidden, barely daring to breathe as we watched it. We couldn't call for help, the lack of cell service in this remote area making it impossible. 
We could only hope it would leave so that we could flee with our lives. Who, what is that thing? Kathy whispered as quietly as possible. I don't know, I replied, trying to keep my voice steady and low. But we need to stay hidden and wait for an opportunity to get out of here. Moments dragged on like a lifetime as the creature continued its patrol through the house, going from room to room. Its grotesque appearance seemed carefully engineered for instilling fear and panic its bloated body exuding malice and gore. Then, without warning, it lunged at another room in the house where two civilians had been hiding, horrified by the inhuman sounds emanating from the clash. Kathy squeezed my hand tightly in terror as we listened to their desperate cries for help. They didn't stand a chance against that monstrous beast. I felt helpless and anguished at our inability to prevent their brutal demise. With anguish in our hearts, Kathy and I decided that our survival depended on finding an exit from this nightmare-filled house while the creature was occupied with its savage attack. We can't just leave them, Kathy said desperately, her grip on my hand tightening even more. Kathy, there's nothing we can do for them now, I replied solemnly. We need to focus on getting out of here alive and calling for backup. Our escape became a game of cat and mouse staying hidden while cautiously moving closer towards freedom. We knew our chances of exiting unnoticed were slim but fueled by fear. We had no choice but to continue advancing. Suddenly, the creature's attack on the civilians stopped, producing an eerie silence throughout the house. My heart raced, knowing we didn't have any time to spare. I spotted our potential escape route, an open window down the hall that seemed accessible if we could just make it undetected. With each cautious step towards the window, my heart pounded hard in my chest, and I prayed for a successful escape. Just as we were mere feet away from the window, I accidentally bumped into a broken chair leg on the floor. The echoing sound of it scraping against the floorboards felt like a gunshot in my ears. The creature heard it too. It turned its vicious gaze towards us, fixing its bulging eyes on our location and letting out an earth-shattering roar of rage. Panic surged through my body as I knew running was our only option. Go, Kathy! Run! I shouted pushing her towards the open window and quickly following suit. We leaped out of the window and onto the cold ground below, narrowly escaping the creature's grasping claws. We sprinted away from the treacherous house, fueled by pure adrenaline and fear, not looking back until we reached the safety of our police cruiser. In relative safety at last, we frantically called for backup providing an almost incoherent retelling of the night's events and finally catching our breath within the semi-dark vehicle. In the aftermath of this horrifying encounter, those poor civilians who didn't escape became etched into my memory, a constant reminder that not all evil can be fought or defeated by conventional means. The creature still looms as an enigma, its origin and purpose unknown. All we do know is that it represents a predator unlike any we had ever encountered, one that made even seasoned officers like ourselves feel powerless in its presence. Although we never found an explanation or solution for this monstrous being during our time on duty, the experience instilled in both Kathy and me a newfound respect for the unknown and an appreciation for the fleeting nature of safety in our unpredictable world. My name is Officer Quentin Allerton, and as a small-town cop, you'd expect life to be pretty straightforward. My work in Asbury Park, New Jersey, sure had its ups and downs, but I never thought it could turn into something so bizarre. I was patrolling the boardwalk, checking in on local business owners before closing time. Edmund Thackeray, the owner of a little trinket shop near the oceanfront, invited me in for a chat. 
While we were talking about his wife's recent recovery from a car accident, we heard strange noises coming from the back of his store. Having a natural skepticism to unusual events, I investigated further. As I approached the storage area at the back, the noise intensified and became more disconcerting. To my horror, I discovered fresh blood spread across several shelves. Puzzled by the lack of any bodies or clear cause of the massacre, I turned to see Thackeray standing at the entrance, pale and wide-eyed with terror. I reassured him that everything would be fine and asked if he knew anything about this horrendous scene. He hesitated and began muttering about strange incidents he'd heard of over the years, people going missing or finding mutilated remains. I chalked it up to urban legends and set out to examine more of this gruesome incident. Stepping outside again, the crisp air calmed me down as I called for backup. Soon enough, my colleagues Charlotte Summers and Jason Keats arrived at the scene to help investigate. After briefing them on Thackeray's story and showing them the storage area, we started formulating theories. As we canvassed neighboring businesses for information, Charlotte spotted what appeared to be claw marks that slashed through brick walls behind several shops. Our minds raced through possible explanations as our gut feelings told us something unbelievable lurked nearby. So, chuckled Jason nervously before launching into one of the lamb's worst jokes. Why did the officer go to art school? He paused. To learn how to draw a gun. Get it? We couldn't help but smile despite the increasing tension in the air. Reading our expressions, Jason added, Well, we've got to lighten this situation up, right? While our team tried to stay focused amidst the eerie occurrences and unanswered questions, we noticed other peculiar tracks that joined us on our route. Claw marks blended into small footprints and periodically disappeared before start ING again further down the block. That evening, I sat in my patrol car attempting to make sense of what had transpired. I felt fear clench my chest as I tried desperately not to let my imagination get the best of me. The strange discoveries continued over several weeks. Mutilated victims appeared out of nowhere and mysterious tracks appeared regularly throughout town. Then, Loretta Stevens, a local high school teacher, went missing without any trace. Although we searched for her relentlessly, no evidence could be found to reveal Loretta's whereabouts or how she may have disappeared. Desperate for leads, our investigation turned increasingly morose as we failed to find answers or bring closure to her grieving family. As weeks turned into months, it became clear that whatever was causing these grisly events would not relent any time soon. Distraught and utterly baffled by the macabre mystery unfolding before our eyes, we continued looking for explanations and ways to stop these tormenting attacks on our community. Now I sit here reflecting on these unusual occurrences as various situations race through my head. This thing, whatever it may be, is unpredictable and ruthless. Many believe it can tear through metal and concrete with its vicious claws while concealing itself perfectly from sight. Pondering my thoughts further leaves me crippled by fear. I'm catching glimpses of that disturbed storage area where this all began, and I can't shake the feeling that we're being toyed with by this enigmatic killer. My life's purpose has always revolved around serving my community, protecting it from all threats at all costs. And yet, the truth of this unexplainable monster and what it is capable of is difficult to face without hesitation. Town meetings were held to discuss the predicament, with residents suggesting ways of avoiding the danger outside. Neighbors formed a night patrol system, taking turns to watch for any unexplained occurrences or attacks. I volunteered myself, wanting to contribute to the safety of my community. We purchased security cameras and installed them at strategic locations around the town. 
We hoped that capturing any evidence of this horrifying creature would give us some information on how to avoid it or potentially protect ourselves. Through trial and error, we found that staying in groups and sticking to well-traveled areas helped us avoid the attacks. Numerous missing people had been alone when they disappeared, so we concluded that this brutal creature preferred solitary prey. In doing so, we unknowingly established a pattern of behavior that pushed the attacks farther from town. One night, while accompanying a neighbor during a patrol shift, we heard something disturbing, an unmistakable ripping sound followed by low growls. We cautiously approached the source of the noise, only to stumble upon a gruesome scene. A chunk of flesh lay on the ground, clearly torn from some poor victim. Peeling back fear, I took out my phone and snapped several photos of the carnage. As we moved away from the site in shock, I thought of what kind of creature could be responsible for such savagery and noticed something unusual. Deep claw marks etched into metal trash cans near where we had found the victim's remains. We showed these photos to other members of our patrol team at our next meeting. Although none of us were experts in forensics or animal behavior, we collectively agreed that this predator was something our minds couldn't fully comprehend, a finely calibrated killing machine designed specifically for destruction. And still, no one called for help beyond our small town's borders. Instead, we stubbornly chose to face this horror head-on while continuing to protect one another as best as we could provide. It wasn't long before more attacks occurred. The creature seemed to have adapted more sinister tactics, patiently waiting for its prey to wander into deserted areas where it could shred them beyond recognition. As our strategy crumbled under relentless violence, we knew we couldn't maintain this level of vigilance and safety any longer. Finally, as one final gut-wrenching attack claimed the life of a beloved teacher's assistant, our mayor demanded action. It was now that we reached out for help from outside agencies' law enforcement and wildlife experts alike. A team of investigators arrived, determined to find the source of these vicious killings. We presented them with all the information we had gathered over the months, the mutilated remains, security camera footage of an impossibly fast-moving shadow, and my photos from that horrifying night. As they sifted through all the data, they made a chilling discovery. The creature responsible for the carnage had features resembling a bear that walked on two legs when it chose to be seen but could easily blend into its surroundings. It was something thought only to exist solely within nightmares or horror stories a seemingly unstoppable force of nature. With new information and an urban hunt now underway, we intensified our efforts to track down this elusive monster. However, it appeared that the creature was smarter than we initially believed and continued avoiding capture. After several fruitless days under scrutiny from investigative agencies, we came to a shattering realization. We could no longer overlook these events or try to fight back against this unknown monster alone. It was time for us as a community to move beyond our fears and be truly there for one another in this time of darkness. As months turned into years and these grisly events became subdued, a new chapter emerged, one marked by unity and hope. We had faced an incomprehensible horror, but in doing so, discovered our shared humanity and unwavering loyalty to one another. This terrible saga will forever linger in the hearts of its affected survivors, but it forged a stronger, more resilient town. The memory of our lost friends will haunt us for the rest of our lives, serving as a grim reminder to cherish the ones we still have and appreciate the brief gift of time we are given. I woke up to the blaring sound of my phone, a disturbance that could indicate only one thing, an emergency. My name is Jedediah Copeland, but people around Hudson, Ohio, 
where I work as a small town cop, just call me Jed. My initial reluctance for a long day ahead quickly evaporated when I thought about Martha and the kids waiting for me back home. Before losing myself in thoughts about dinner plans, I received a call from Deputy Samuelson with a stuttering voice reporting something impossible, a sudden surge of murders and missing persons in our quiet small town. Unsure of his sanity at this point, I tried to console him. Sammy, settle down. Let's grab our gear and see what this is all about. Despite my skepticism, a chill ran up my spine as we arrived at the crime scene. The sight defied description, dismembered bodies like some gruesome piece of modern art painted in blood. A nauseating mix of shock and horror washed over me. What could have done this? Samuelson questioned aloud. The crime scene suggested that whatever was responsible might not be human at all. As we collected evidence, the feeling of unease persisted. More reports flooded in as whispers amongst the townspeople grew louder regarding an unknown creature lurking around town. A brief moment of levity came when our boss cracked an ill-timed joke. You know it's bad when even telling dad jokes can't lighten the mood, sighed Samuelson. Little did we know that acknowledging that we don't have enough time to place barricades on streets would become morbidly ironic. I tried to rationalize the murders by attributing them to some rogue animal or a disturbed criminal. But deep down inside, I knew that theory wouldn't hold for long as my fellow officers spoke in hushed tones about the terrifying reality staring us in the face. Whatever was out there was capable of killing us all. As angry as I was about the murders and the loved ones that had been taken from their families, I couldn't quell the terror festering within me at the prospect of this unknown beast lurking just beyond sight. The seemingly coordinated attacks only fueled our questions. Were these murders connected to a nearby escaped convict? I decided to visit the local library to research any historical data on similar incidents or folklore that could somehow explain this creature's existence. That was when I stumbled upon a disturbing pattern. Reports from over a century ago described a monster of indescribable horror that would appear to deliver death and destruction every few generations. The description was frighteningly accurate, a gnarled creature standing on four legs, razor-sharp claws like gleaming sides, and eyes that pierced the soul. It hunted in vicious bursts, eluding capture before disappearing for years at a time. My hands shook as I read through witness accounts of primitive weaponry like bullets and blades only passing through the seemingly immortal creature. Was there no way to stop it? Word around town spread faster than wildfire as panic reached fever pitch. Our demands for reinforcements fell on deaf ears as other forces regarded us as victims of shared hysteria. People turned their fear into aggression, attacking us for our inability to protect them. Hudson had become a pressure cooker of terror with no release in sight. Resolving to end this ordeal, Samuelson procured extra ammunition and firearms from the armory. With grim determination etched on his face, he remarked, We can't bring back those we lost, but maybe we can put an end to this madness. The irony didn't go unnoticed. Two cops outgunned and outmatched by an enigmatic creature straight out of humanity's worst nightmares. An abrupt report of another attack came through our radios as we raced towards the scene. The lack of daylight coupled with dense foliage in the forest blurred our perception. Hearts pounding, we advanced cautiously, weapon in hand. As Samuelson and I approached the attack site, we noticed a commotion near the edge of the forest. The local townsfolk had gathered, forming an angry mob intent on bringing the creature down regardless of their lack of skill or weaponry. Their fear-fueled determination rang clear in their shouts and hurried arguments. We decided to split up, thinking it would be best if he talked to the agitated mob while I approached the scene of the attack. 
Although we could have called for backup, we knew that any hope for it was slim due to disbelief from higher-ups. We had to address the immediate threat ourselves. Cautiously, weapon at the ready, I edged toward where the last attack occurred. There were unmistakable signs of struggle, branches ripped from trees, deep claw marks gouged into bark, and splatters of blood painting a horrifying scene. However, there seemed to be no sign of life, not even an injured survivor. I pressed further through the forest, gun raised as my eyes scanned left and right for any sign of movement. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream pierced the thick silence of the forest, a cry that was abruptly cut short mere seconds later. Panic gripped me as I rushed toward its origin, hoping against all odds that I might save whoever was in danger. Instead, I stumbled upon a chilling sight, a mutilated body which seemed to have been almost crushed before being torn apart by whatever beast had inflicted such savagery upon it. The mere sight threatened to make me sick, but still I persisted cautiously forward. The creature was close. I could feel its presence bearing down on me like an oppressive weight. The air grew colder and heavy with malice as I continued searching for this monstrous embodiment of terror itself. Then without warning, it was there. Its foul stench filled my nostrils as its shadow fell over me from above. It snarled menacingly, revealing its rows of jagged, discolored teeth and malevolent eyes that burned with fury. Recognizing the grave peril I found myself in, I raised my weapon toward the creature and emptied the chamber. Bullets flew but passed right through it as if it weren't even there. The eldritch monstrosity lunged at me, but narrowly missed. I sprinted back toward the town, desperately hoping Samuelson had convinced the townsfolk to disperse and return to safety. We need to evacuate. I gasped as I stumbled into his embrace. This creature is unstoppable. We're outmatched. Samuelson nodded, his face strained of color yet set in determination. I'll organize a mandatory evacuation, he replied briskly. We can't stop this thing on our own. Days later, we stood together as we watched Hudson disappear in the rearview mirror of our cruiser. Most residents had fled, while a small number decided to continue living within their doomed town, knowing full well the horror that awaited them. After endless discussions with experts in various fields, we still had no answers about what species the creature belonged to or how to deal with it. All we knew was that for now, it remained among those who stayed behind in Hudson, a terrifying reminder of our vulnerability when faced with an inexplicable enemy. In time, memories began to fade and whispered stories were locked away in dusty corners of consciousness. We kept records of all we had witnessed so others might learn from our experiences if history ever repeated itself though we hoped against hope that it would not. Instead, we moved forward. We built new lives far away from the nightmare that haunted us like an unshakable specter. Even now, as I write these words down decades later, I find myself looking over my shoulder every so often, wondering whether one day those burning eyes will find me again. For the truth remains ever-present. There are horrors in this world beyond our comprehension, horrors which threaten to tear apart our very existence— and when they emerge from the shadows, we must be ready. I woke up early that morning, just like any other day. My name's Officer Rick Willard, and I serve the people of Crestwood, a sleepy town tucked away amongst the dense forests of northern Montana. The town boasted lush greenery and some of the largest pines you've ever seen. Crestwood was a beautiful place to live, but it wasn't without its fair share of secrets and unusual occurrences. As I polished off the remains of my breakfast, I glanced at a recent photograph of my wife and son. 
They were my everything, and they always found a way to keep me grounded amidst the chaos that surrounded my line of work. I made my way to the station where gossip of the latest missing person report was abuzz. Damn, I muttered as Police Chief Stevens filled me in on some details. Another family distraught over their missing loved one. This is unusual, Rick, Chief Stevens mentioned, his rough voice straining with concern. We've never had anything like this before, and now too in just one week. The first victim had been found mutilated near a deer trail not far from town a gruesome sight even for an experienced cop like me. Before I knew it, I found myself at the scene where volunteers combed the edges of the forest searching for any sign of 21-year-old Sarah Daniels, last seen hiking near Ravine Trail a few days prior. Her best friend, Luke Kingston, spoke urgently as he helped coordinate search efforts. Officer Willard, Sarah loved photography. She was always going on hikes to capture snaps for her portfolio. Luke paused, choking back tears. Please, please find Sarah. Days turned into nights as we continued our desperate search for Sarah Daniels. It was getting late when Carol Bunsen from the search party radioed frantically. We have some interesting information. Come right away. Gathering what little energy I had left, I found Carol and a few others staring at the base of a tree where there appeared to be claw marks like that of a bear's but somehow different. The terror was evident in everyone's eyes, knowing that these marks had not been there the day before. But worse still Sarah Daniel's backpack, containing her camera and water bottle lay just a few feet away. The grim discovery led us back into town, where we quickly organized ourselves into nightly rotating watch shifts around Crestwood's borders. While on patrol one cold night, with only the sounds of the forest to keep me company, I spotted movement off in the distance. Grabbing my flashlight, I approached cautiously, every muscle tense with nerves. It was almost impossible to make any sense out of what was lurking in the shadows. The creature seemed to be large and hulking its piercing red eyes locked onto mine as it lunged towards me in a blur of motion. The sudden panic brought time to a crawl even though I managed to pull my gun from its holster. I felt myself freeze up as the monstrosity barreled onwards. Dread fastened like iron grips around my heart when— with only inches between us, it decided otherwise and retreated back into the shadows from whence it came. All that remained was an odd sensation of cold air brushing against my skin as panic coursed through every vein in my body. Returning to town, I gathered Chief Stevens and others within our tight-knit community. Listen, I said carefully, what we're dealing with is no ordinary creature. The room filled with murmured disbelief as we shared hushed exchanges in the dimly lit council chamber. How can this be? Someone voiced tentatively. A shaky laugh escaped me as I tried to diffuse the tension. Well, looks like we've got ourselves one heck of a situation here. An actual monster at our doorstep. It's like we're in some begrade horror flick somebody call Hollywood. My attempt at humor was met with looks of weary discomfort as a terrifying reality began to settle in, yet it wasn't long before we began to discuss viable solutions we knew that time was running out. Resources were pooled, and reinforcements called in from neighboring towns. Fear clung to the air while the next few days blurred into one endless hunt for the mysterious creature. We called in expert trackers— equipped ourselves with weapons and non-lethal traps, and split into teams for the search. The creature had left a trail of mutilated carcasses, dashcam footage confirming it wasn't some overgrown bear or mountain lion. It was bipedal, covered in thick fur, with unusually long limbs and an unnerving ability to melt into the shadows. During our search, we discovered several makeshift dens where it seemed the creature had sought temporary refuge. The air reeked of rotting flesh and a foul, 
indescribable stench. We collected samples for examination in hopes it would shed light on what we were dealing with. Days went by as we continued to patrol the area. Then tragedy struck. A distressing radio call from one of our tracker teams. They were under attack. We rushed to their location, only to find the team's leader, Michael Briggs, lying in his own blood. His face bore a petrified expression, while deep gashes on his body told the gruesome story. Grief-stricken and enraged, we were now more determined than ever to apprehend the beast. Reinforcements arrived from neighboring towns as well as experts from various fields. Biologists to examine its anatomy and behavior patterns. Psychologists to analyze possible motivations. Military personnel armed with state-of-the-art equipment for neutralizing threats. As a community, we struggled under the burden of fear but refused to be silenced or placated by comfort or false safety. Our mission became one clear goal, end this nightmare before more lives were lost. The creature's defiance lasted only so long before its instincts faltered just enough for our forces to corner it at last. But despite weeks of planning and preparation, nothing could have prepared us for what unfolded next. Its force was insurmountable. Even though multiple tranquilizer darts found their mark upon it, they seemed to have little effect. It fought with a brutal, ferocious strength that defied any standard we'd ever seen in nature. More lives were lost that night, each victim remembered in hushed tones among us while we continued our fight. Finally, after a long and gruesome battle, we managed to subdue the creature. Restrained with chains designed for holding the most violent of predators, it was left with no choice but to succumb to its injuries and the drugs coursing through its veins. An air of relief washed over our town, despite the lingering sense of loss for those who had perished. We'd won, but at an immense cost. In search of answers, experts started analyzing the captured creature. Weighing around 600 pounds and standing at 8 feet tall when upright, its proportions alone left us astounded. Covered in scars and injuries from years of battles with unknown foes, the creature's origin remained a mystery, as DNA analyses proved frustratingly inconclusive. Physical studies pointed toward it being some form of undiscovered carnivorous predator. One expert team hypothesized it might be a remnant of some long-lost species that had somehow survived extinction. Whatever it was, this monster was obsessed with survival as much as destruction. The aftermath of our encounter with the creature was nothing short of transformative for our small community. Though rumors continued to swirl about other instances of terrifying creatures lurking in wild areas all around us, we now recognize that when faced with fear and obsession, our response must be measured and rational, just as we had done in this ordeal. We banded together and overcame a seemingly unstoppable force. Reflecting upon this victory allowed us to regain some semblance of normalcy. Memorials were held for those who had lost their lives during this harrowing event, their names etched upon a monument standing tall in the town square, yet another reminder of both our losses and triumphs. Perhaps we will never again face such a formidable foe, but if history repeats itself as it has before, we can only hope to be prepared for what might lie ahead. It was a day like any other in my small town, taking care of paperwork and responding to minor incidents here and there. I'm Officer Malachi Corcoran, a small-town cop born and raised in Calusa, California. Before joining law enforcement, I dabbled in carpentry and spent some time traveling the States with my wife, Marty. However, nothing could have prepared me for the nightmare that lay ahead. The chief had asked me to look into a string of missing persons reports. It seemed odd, 
so many people disappearing within a month in our little town. Coincidences are rare in Kalusa. As I began investigating, I noticed all the victims were last seen at our local park alongside the Sacramento River. This picturesque area was perfect for families, joggers, and weekend fishermen. At first glance, it seemed unlikely that such vile acts could be committed there. I had my buddy, Officer Ethan Thornley, assist me with gathering witness statements while I pored over previous cases in search of potential connections. Nothing conclusive emerged from our efforts until we found a hiker's trail cam footage. In the blurry image was a creature unlike anything we'd seen before. Tall, and covered in dark leathery skin with bright crimson eyes illuminating the darkness. The unsettling aspect was that it walked upright like a human, and seemed to be dragging something. Ethan suggested we set up surveillance near the local park entrance on the outskirts of town after sundown. We parked our patrol car next to tall shrubs, forming an ideal cover to monitor any suspicious activities. Hours passed uneventfully as darkness enveloped us. We kept our eyes peeled on every movement around us, patiently waiting for further signs of the creature we'd observed in the photograph earlier on. Suddenly, we heard a blood-curdling scream from deep within the wooded area near us. We bolted out of our concealment with our firearms at the ready, carefully navigating through the dense vegetation as we followed the sounds of distress. As we neared the location, I spotted a trail of blood leading to a makeshift hideout made from sticks and leaves. Careful not to alert anyone or anything to our presence, Ethan and I approached the hideout, every muscle in our bodies tense. My pulse raced as we turned the corner into an opening where we finally caught sight of that hellish beast. It towered over an unconscious victim, blood dripping from its sharp claws. The creature was horrifyingly grotesque, clearly not a product of this world. We faced a grim reality. There was no backup for miles around. Attempting to call for help would be futile at such a crucial moment. Time was of the essence if we wanted to save this poor soul from their doom. I signaled Ethan to cover me while I aimed my gun at the creature. In true buddy cop fashion, he cracked a lopsided grin and said, you know what they say, another day, another slimy otherworldly nightmare. But humor only went so far in masking our fear. Taking a deep breath, I took one last look at Ethan before squeezing the trigger. The bullet pierced the creature's thick skin, and it let out a deafening roar of pain and rage. It whipped its head around its beady eyes locking on us and examining us as its next potential targets. Ethan and I knew this was our only chance to save the victim. We sprinted forward with our guns aimed at the repulsive beast, some type of mutated beast that was larger than any animal we'd ever seen. Its misshapen body writhed violently in response to the gunshot wounds inflicted by our weapons. The creature snarled and leaped towards us with unnatural speed and agility, its massive weight shaking the ground beneath us. We reacted instinctively, sidestepping its lunge and continuing our attempts at incapacitating it. Why are we not calling for backup? Ethan yelled over the cacophony of roars and gunfire. No time! If this thing takes off or kills the victim before help arrives, we'll never see it again. I shouted back, my focus firmly on avoiding another one of the vicious attacks. For hours, it seemed like time had slowed to a crawl as we tried desperately to outmaneuver this horrifying enemy. Our ammunition dwindled until finally, we had fired our last shots which surprisingly worked at stopping the enraged monster with a guttural moan. As soon as it fell motionless to the ground, Ethan rushed to the unconscious victim while I kept watch over the seemingly lifeless creature. There was no guarantee that it wouldn't suddenly spring back to life, if, alive, could even be considered an appropriate term for this twisted mass of flesh and bone. 
Ethan quickly assessed the injured person, finding that, thankfully, their wounds weren't fatal. He administered first aid while I dialed emergency services, unable to take my eyes off the fallen abomination. Help arrived soon after, and the victim was transported to the nearest hospital for further treatment. As for the creature, it was taken into custody by a team of specialized agents from an unknown government agency. They offer no explanation as to its origin or even their own purpose, though none was required. We were just thankful it was over. Ethan and I laid in our motel room later that night, restless and unable to shake the images of the monstrous predator we'd encountered. We knew this wasn't something we could discuss with our colleagues, friends, or family. No one would ever believe such a tale. The following day, we paid a visit to the hospital where the brave survivor was recovering. The relief in their eyes radiated through us as they thanked us repeatedly. Although exhaustion weighed upon our very souls, their words were a welcome comfort that at least we had been able to save one life from that nightmare. As we left the hospital, our course as investigators now forever altered, we considered what other horrors may lurk hidden away from civilization's eyes. The unknown origin of that revolting creature lingered heavily on our minds, gnawing away at any semblance of normalcy that once existed. In time, perhaps someone might unravel its heinous origin, but until then, Ethan and I vowed silently with mutual understanding that we'd continue protecting those who needed us against such unfathomable threats. The experience had changed us both indelibly. We now faced an uncertain future tainted by a shared memory of the grotesque adversary we triumphed over. It was another typical evening in the small town of Bridgewater, Virginia. I'm Officer Richard Mallory a cop who had experienced just about everything in his career. Well, at least that's what I thought. As corny as it sounds, this job was my life ever since I left a lucrative accountancy firm five years ago. The adrenaline hooked me. A call from dispatch broke the silence, informing me about some disturbance near an old house on Hilford Street. The neighbors were reporting weird noises emanating from the place. It wasn't new for someone to play a practical joke in town. After all, everyone knew each other. Upon arrival, I spotted a kid named John Hydauer sprinting out of the house. As much as that dared me to crack up, duty called. Speaking with John revealed how he and his friends found some trail of blood leading into the basement, only to uncover something horrific behind the rickety closet door. He couldn't describe what they witnessed but insisted I should go and look for myself. The dread of entering a spooky-looking building did get to me, but I took pride in being unshakable during these situations. Stepping inside made it evident that nobody had stepped foot here in ages. The layers of dust on everything were appalling. Towards the basement door, I noticed an unmistakable copper smell, blood. It wasn't uncommon for hunters and trespassers to stash their kills on abandoned properties around town, but this felt different somehow. As I opened the closet door John mentioned earlier, my eyes fell upon something unbelievable, a creature unlike anything I had seen before, monstrous by every sense yet brilliantly camouflaged until now. The human-like figure stood hunched over with hands bearing razor-sharp claws bearing resemblance to crustacean pincers its mouth filled with dagger-like teeth exuding terror into any observer's heart. A sudden cry for help outside compelled me to grasp my radio, asking more officers to converge at the location. Whoever this monstrosity had cornered, I couldn't leave them alone with it. Upon exiting the basement... I chanced upon a local teenager named Tara Leitner, who was panicking and babbling incoherently about another one of her friends getting dragged off into the woods. As a town cop, I knew Tara well enough. 
she wasn't a mischief maker. Sheaving my gun, I guided her towards my patrol car for safety as I prepared to follow the blood trail into the bushes. Thousand thoughts raced through my mind. The weirdest crime scene I had ever encountered was unfolding right in front of me. As dark clouds gathered over Bridgewater and light rain drizzling, the surrounding felt eerie. A terrified scream echoed from somewhere deeper in the woods. It wasn't just an animal. It was something or someone begging for mercy. Following that chilling sound, I stumbled upon a sinister sight a mutilated body hanging from a tree branch. The lifeless eyes staring back at me belonged to none other than Sammy Lungstone, another local boy. The sight in front of me was heart-wrenching and terrifying at once. What lurked in the shadows seemed capable of tormenting and butchering anyone in its path. I tried to shake away my trepidation as I quietly muttered a prayer for Sammy's soul. Carefully examining the area, I came across signs that indicated multiple victims, yet more from our town might have crossed paths with this maleficent creature. Mustering every ounce of composure and courage within me, I proceeded further into the heart of darkness where evil awaited, unfazed by human tragedy or remorse. With each step closer to uncovering its hiding place, a gnawing dread escalated within me that my own life might soon be snuffed out by this anonymous entity. As I ventured ahead, with rainfall intensifying, I suddenly heard a loud noise in the underbrush. Gripping my firearm tightly, I swung around and attempted to focus my vision in the rain and darkness. A fleeting glimpse of the fearsome figure stalking its next prey brought about a sense of sheer terror and urgency. I wasn't sure how much longer I could keep up this emotionally draining and macabre pursuit. Regardless, there was no going back, for others' fates and this town might hang in balance if I failed to put an end to the scorning crimes that unfolded. Rainfall soaking my clothes, I traveled further into the wooded area where the creature had been seen last. Fatigue weighed heavily on me, but my resolve forced me onward. The thought of more innocent people falling prey to this abomination made my stomach turn. Approaching a clearing, I heard rustling in some bushes beside me. My heart pounded as I held my gun at the ready, bracing for a possible attack. However, nothing emerged. It seemed that my mind was playing tricks on me. A voice shouted out from behind me. Hey, wait up! It was Mike, a fellow local resident who had joined in the search effort. We need to call for help! He exclaimed breathlessly. No, I replied firmly. There's no time. More people might die if we don't act fast. Mike hesitated but ultimately agreed, and so we continued on our path together. The creature seemed to be playing games with us, leaving a trail of blood and remains that led deeper into the darkness. We tracked the beast through thickets and over rocks until we came across a cave entrance. Let's do this, whispered Mike, fear obvious in his tone even though it was barely audible. Despite our apprehensions, we entered the cave side by side. Inside was like something out of a nightmare, blood stains on the walls and floors, scattered bones and torn clothing. In the center of it all was a pile of rotting flesh mixed with human remains. That's when the creature appeared, an enormous beast covered in fur and filth with long claws capable of tearing apart its victims with ease. Its face was nightmarish flat and snout filled with razor-sharp teeth and cold black eyes staring at us as if to say we were next. A low guttural growl echoed through the cave as it approached us slowly. I fired several shots at the creature, but the bullets seemed to have no effect on it. Mike and I exchanged panicked glances before making a desperate decision to flee. As we sprinted back towards the entrance— the creature lunged forward and grabbed Mike by the leg, pulling him back towards its lair. 
Mike's screams echoed through the cave as I frantically scrambled for my phone to call for help. 911, what's your emergency? The operator's voice was calm and unyielding. There's a creature attacking people in the woods. I gasped out, desperately trying to catch my breath. Stay where you are. Help is on the way, the operator instructed. My heart raced as I debated between waiting for help and going back for Mike, but in that moment, I knew his chances of survival were slim against this monstrous entity. When the police arrived at the entrance of the cave, I directed them inside to where the creature had taken Mike. As we entered, there was no sign of it or Mike, just bloodstains and more fresh remains. Everyone who saw it firsthand was horrified by what had transpired. The weeks that followed were filled with terror, as more people went missing and questions were left unanswered. The nature of these events remained shrouded in mystery, with no concrete explanation for them. The town eventually came together to mourn our losses. Sammy Livingstone, Mike, and several others who had fallen victim to this savage beast. Speculation grew as locals whispered about what could have caused it all, from a mutated animal driven by hunger to a government experiment gone horribly awry. In light of these tragedies, one thing was clear, our once innocent town was forever changed by this sinister series of events, grief and fear now ingrained in our very beings. Though the creature may have vanished into obscurity for now, its haunting memory lingers, casting a dark shadow over us all, ever reminding us of the horrors it inflicted. I'm Marcus Dunlevy, a cop in the small town of Pine Grove, nestled in the Oregon wilderness. Our usual crime rate was minimal and occasional theft or bar fight. One Tuesday while having lunch with my partner, Benjamin Ben Larrabee, I found myself reminiscing about my hometown of Brooklyn and how my life had changed. Then came our big case. You hear about old man Peterson? Went missing last week, Ben mentioned as he chomped his sandwich. They say hikers found some clothes in the woods. Torn up pretty bad. Maybe an animal? You ever hear an animal keep people up all night with weird noises? He asked directly. You've lived here longer than me, Ben. Do you believe in all that local folklore? My skepticism shone through. He shrugged. Sometimes. But other times, just makes me wonder. Over the following weeks, we searched the surrounding forests for any clues or traces of Mr. Peterson. Nothing turned up except more questions. Townsfolk were terrified. Whispers turned to hysterical rumors about what lurked outdoors after dark. People kept indoors as night fell earlier during autumn. Mid-November arrived and Ben told me we'd received an anonymous tip about another missing person. This can't just be a coincidence, Ben grumbled as we climbed into our patrol car. Maybe this isn't related to Mr. Peterson, but it is strange. One day we were interviewing hikers by the Pine Grove Trail when they shared something useful. There's this old cabin off to the east, one hiker recalled. Seems abandoned, though sometimes you can hear sounds coming from inside. You think someone's hiding there? I queried. Maybe, he replied hesitantly. We trekked through dense foliage and soon discovered the cabin virtually engulfed in climbing ivy. Peering through a shattered window, the interior appeared abandoned. No one had disturbed its remains in years. Maybe we should check it out at night, Ben suggested. We'd have a better understanding of whatever's happening. Returning under cover of darkness, the forest seemed more sinister, shadows dancing in our flashlights as we approached the dilapidated structure. Ben dutifully paced beside me. Feel that? he whispered. 
The air just got colder. We entered the cabin cautiously, wary of any signs of life. As we delved deeper, floorboards groaning beneath us, something caught my eye. Heavy chains bound to the stone fireplace with iron braces. Then, I muttered, pointing. What would somebody do with those? Nothing good. His face darkened. Heading back to town, we agreed to keep our findings secret until we gathered more information. I sensed heavy unease settling in my gut. This place felt wrong. Another week passed and people grew frantic about their missing loved ones' fates. We interviewed locals and sadly found no solid leads. One evening during patrol, an emergency call came through. Witnesses saw a creature near Miller Street. Looks like it attacked someone. My pulse quickened as Ben accelerated with urgency. Once on the scene, we found bystanders huddled nearby. You see that thing? One stammered. It was hideous. I never seen anything like it before. As we ventured forward against rising anxiety, I marked a determined path to confront whatever monstrous entity terrorized our town and endangered these unsuspecting individuals. As we approached the injured person, my heart raced, knowing we were getting closer to confronting this creature that had been terrorizing the town. At this point, I knew that contacting additional help was essential, so I called for backup. Ben and I couldn't handle this alone. We needed support from our fellow law enforcement officers. When our colleagues arrived, we shared a brief update with them about what the witnesses had described. One witness trembled as he retold the story. The creature was massive, its body covered in coarse fur, and had unusually long arms and legs. Its eyes were a blood-red color, and its mouth housed rows of razor-sharp teeth. The fear in his voice was palpable. The victim on the ground moaned in pain while trying to describe how it felt when the creature attacked him. It was like being mauled by a beast with unimaginable strength and speed. The sight of this man's torn clothes and deep lacerations sent shivers down my spine. As we were about to begin our search for this unknown monster, another frantic cry for help came in through the radio. There had been another attack just a few streets away. We divided into groups to better cover the area. While searching through the neighborhood, I couldn't stop thinking about those chains we found at the cabin earlier. Were they used to restrain this creature? But who or what might have had control over it? My train of thought halted upon receiving an urgent message from Ben. In need of assistance by Oakwood Drive. Possible sighting. We rushed to meet Ben, who appeared shaken but unharmed when we arrived. He explained how he caught a glimpse of the creature lurking behind a nearby house before it disappeared into thicker vegetation. We organized a search party and started combing through the area with extreme caution. As we moved deeper into the woods, armed with guns and flashlights, unfamiliar sounds echoed through the darkness. We prepared ourselves for what seemed to be an inevitable confrontation. Suddenly, a piercing scream rang out, followed by agonizing cries and the sound of a body being dragged away. We rushed towards the commotion and found one of our colleagues on the ground, lifeless. It appeared that this creature had ripped him apart before fleeing further into the woods. Our grief was immeasurable. There was no turning back now. We continued our pursuit as hours passed, gradually losing hope of finding this beast. Exhaustion crept in, and we decided to regroup and come up with a new plan. We knew we were dealing with something we couldn't readily comprehend— and our strategies needed re-evaluation. Back at the station, we contacted experts on elusive animal behavior and detailed all our findings thus far. However, they could only provide educated guesses about what we were dealing with. Nothing concrete surfaced. 
They recommended consulting a zoologist specializing in undiscovered species for more specific information. In the meantime, we decided to stay vigilant and set up surveillance cameras near where the attacks took place. We knew it was only a matter of time before this monster would strike again, so we continued our patrols and attempted to keep the town calm. A few days later, while reviewing camera footage with Ben and other colleagues, my heart leaped as I caught sight of that hideous creature skulking in the shadows again. There was no mistaking it this time. Its enormous size and grotesque features fit what witnesses had described. However, its species remained unidentifiable. Nothing like it had ever been documented before. As more reinforcements arrived over the next few days from different jurisdictions, tensions began to rise in town. The people demanded answers on how law enforcement could rid them of this monstrous menace. In frustration and not knowing who or what had unleashed such terror upon our community, or what motivated these brutal attacks on innocent people, we aimed all our resources and efforts into apprehending the beast. We would not rest until we succeeded in vanquishing this unknown and seemingly unstoppable creature from our town. Despite our best efforts, the creature ultimately eluded capture. And as time went on, sightings and attacks became less frequent, leaving behind only gruesome memories of its murderous spree. We would never forget those who had fallen victim to this enigmatic, vicious monster. I'm Officer Thomas Merrick, a cop in the small town of Navarre, Ohio. Growing up in this quiet community, I never thought I'd encounter something as horrific as the events that unfolded recently. It started as just another day at work, patrolling the quaint streets of Navarre, where everyone knew their neighbors. Laughter from kids playing in the local park filled the air. My walkie-talkie crackled with a voice from HQ. Hey Tom, we got a domestic disturbance call at the old Fisher place. Can you head over there? The dispatcher, Leslie Cummings, was a good friend of mine. We were both raised in Navarre and had a connection that transcends our profession. Sure thing, Leslie. On my way, I responded casually, heading to the location mentioned over the radio. The house was quite run down, Peeling paint and an unkempt yard were indications that no one had cared for this residence for years. Hesitantly, I knocked on the door. There was no response at first, but upon knocking again, an elderly woman named Mabel Rosha opened it hesitantly. Tears streamed down Mabel's face as she broke into an odd story about her missing husband Henry Rosha. At first glance, it all seemed unbelievable. She claimed something had taken him in the night, while she slept soundly beside him. As I tried to piece together her account of what transpired last night, Mabel suddenly frantically pointed to her backyard. Investigating further revealed strange markings upon the ground and some form of organic residue I couldn't quite identify. When I turned around to ask her more questions about these findings, however, Mabel was gone vanished into thin air in mere heartbeats. That moment sent a visceral chill down my spine. Now alone at this seemingly cursed house, I radioed for backup but received no reply. Even the static on my walkie-talkie was eerily quiet. The atmosphere had changed drastically, and unease settled in my stomach. While waiting for backup, I decided to search the property in hopes of more clues about the strange disappearance. In my exploration, I stumbled upon what appeared to be a hidden door which led to a dimly lit basement below the house. My flashlight revealed the grotesque reality of the situation, blood-stained walls and body parts scattered across the floor. The smell of decaying flesh was overwhelming, but that wasn't what grabbed my attention. 
It was when I saw Mabel's severed head placed in some sort of twisted altar that my blood ran cold. Suddenly, I heard heavy footsteps above me. Looking around in panic, I realized there was no way I could climb back up before whatever beast lurked up there noticed me. Out of options, I hid behind a pile of debris and listened intently. Then I heard it, a malicious snarling noise accompanied by ragged breathing. It echoed through the room as if amplified by sinister intent. My hands started to tremble gripping the flashlight tightly, illuminating the horror before me. A monstrous creature with dark matted fur wandered into view. The unspeakable abomination resembled an enormous bear-like creature with razor-sharp claws and a deformed face every step it took exuded malice and power. The creature loomed over Mabel's remains and began performing some gruesome ritual that nauseated me on sight. In that moment, I could think only one thing, escape. Gathering every ounce of courage deep within me, I decided it was now or never my heart pounding so loudly that it deafened my own thoughts. As I prepared to make my next move, everything went quiet again, too quiet for comfort. The creature seemed to sense something amiss. Its unnerving gaze began to scan the basement, raging ever closer to my hiding spot. Just as it was about to reveal my position, I heard the front door to the house smash open. My backup had finally arrived. The creature snarled in fury and charged upstairs to meet its intruders. Seizing the opportunity, I darted across the basement floor and began frantically climbing my way up. Sweat poured down my face as I pushed myself beyond physical limits, desperate to escape the nightmare below. I quickly scanned the basement looking for any other escape routes or any sign of useful tools or weapons. It seemed futile. The ancient room was dusty and untouched, with little more than a few useless piles of wood and boxes strewn around. I wondered if this house had any other residents, or had been long abandoned. The need to call for help became more urgent than ever. Help! I shouted at the top of my lungs hoping that someone within earshot from outside would hear my desperate pleas. Please, anyone! There was no answer. The team that broke the door must have been too far now or busy fighting with the creature that they couldn't hear my screams. Nearly choking on my nerves, I managed to reach the top of the stairs which led into a dimly lit hallway. My senses heightened as adrenaline pumped through my veins at an alarming rate. Everywhere I looked, shadows seemed to lurch around me. I crept nervously along the hall, praying that any creaking from the old floorboards would not attract attention. I heard distant noises now, loud crashes and what sounded like primal screams reverberating through the house. Clearly, a bloody battle was raging between the abomination and my backup team upstairs. I inched closer to where I thought an exit could be but stopped in my tracks when I suddenly noticed one of our squad members lying on the floor in anguish. He was wounded, deep gashes across his chest and face displayed his fight with the monstrous creature. Is it gone? He whispered through labored breaths while clutching his wounds. I don't know, I replied quietly, struggling to maintain composure in this horrifying scene. Where are the others? He shook his head weakly. Didn't make it. His words were barely audible before everything went silent once again for a moment. Determined to save us both, I cautiously approached the window at the end of the hallway with my injured comrade leaning on my shoulder for support. The glass was shattered, a possible escape route. We have to jump, I said determinedly. He gave me a weak nod, and just as we prepared to lunge, the creature suddenly emerged from an adjacent room. It was injured but still dangerous, its dark matted fur stained with blood and ragged from the battle. Despite its injuries, there was no doubt it could still easily overpower us. 
In a split second, we leapt through the window into the uncertain darkness outside while the enraged creature wailed in frustration. The lingering fear jolted me awake from restless sleep for weeks after that terrifying night. The newspapers reported strange sightings of a bear-like creature roaming around but never provided any definitive explanation or evidence about its existence. As far as I knew, the creature never reappeared again but the gruesome scars it left behind would haunt us forever. Armed with only our bitter memories and deepened understanding of horrors that lurked in our world's dark underbelly, we never dared to speak of it again. Instead, we carried the weight of loss and terror inside us, ever cautious of what might return in the dead of night. It remains a mystery if that creature was some unknown species or merely some twist of cruel fate. But one thing is certain, when darkness falls and unsettling noises emerge from shadowy corners, we will never forget our unnerving encounter with the beast which lurked beneath that long-forgotten house. My name is Dale Howerton, and I've been a cop in Huntsville, Alabama for over a decade. I never really wanted to be anything else. My father was a cop, and his father before him was too. A tradition, I guess. Today started like any other day at work, with some paperwork and banter amongst the team. Something about Yolanda Montfort's dogs going on her neighbor's property again seemed funny at the time. We got a call in the late afternoon. There was an altercation at the local gas station. Apparently, someone found something out of place near the gas pumps. When we arrived on the scene, a small crowd had gathered around, some cracking jokes to ease the tension. Approaching the scene, we saw what all the fuss was about. There was blood everywhere. One of the pumps had been mangled and wrecked beyond recognition. It looked like an animal had come through and devoured whatever had caused this mess. My partner for the day, Kelly Dietrichson, spoke to one of the witnesses who mentioned hearing strange noises last night coming from the woods behind his house. We thanked him for his input but brushed it off as irrelevant. A young girl named Annette Sakalik suddenly cried out that her friend Nora Ingram was missing. Her voice shook with realized fear as she wondered if Nora had something to do with all that blood at the gas station. We decided to investigate further into Nora's disappearance and question her family that lived just outside of town towards where those strange noises were heard. Walking towards their house felt off somehow. It was uncomfortably quiet outside. As we made our way closer into those thick woods, Kelly called for backup but didn't get a response from dispatch. My cell phone wouldn't even work out here either. We seemed to be too far away from any signal tower in these woods. Nora Ingram's house stood silent, surrounded by looming trees casting shadows onto its weathered exterior. No one appeared to be home, but Kelly decided we should enter the house anyway. Upon entering, the house seemed normal and lovingly lived in. We called out for anyone inside, but our words were met with silence. We couldn't check every room safely without backup, so we decided to head back and wait. Kelly took a step off the porch when a crashing sound pierced the silence, shaking the ground beneath us. A creature emerged from the tree line. Its twisted form was like something out of a nightmare, dark, knotted flesh wrapped around its lanky body, and its skin stretched grotesquely over its long limbs. With shiny black eyes sunken into its oblong face, it stared hungrily at us. In an instant, I unholstered my weapon and started firing at the beast. To my horror, the bullets merely sunk into the creature's flesh with a sickening squelch as it continued forward, seemingly unaffected. Kelly followed suit with her own firearm while trying to radio for help once more. 
aging static clouded her pleas for help as if this twisted monster was somehow disrupting our call to the outside world. The creature closed in on us with unnatural speed while we scrambled to find cover. Peering around a tree trunk, I gritted my teeth as I tried to formulate a plan amidst the chaos that had now gripped us in these solitary woods. It skulked towards Kelly's hiding place with horrifying precision as she continued firing recklessly at it. I called out for Kelly to run as I started sprinting towards her location. As I got closer, desperation took hold and I lunged at the abomination to try and pull it off its trajectory towards Kelly. Its skin felt cold and putrid under my grip as it twisted around with inhuman dexterity to face me. I wrestled with the creature, trying to grip its seemingly impenetrable flesh. Kelly took the opportunity to make her escape, shouting for help as she ran toward the cabin. I threw my weight against the creature, sending it crashing into a tree. I knew I couldn't defeat it, but maybe I could give Kelly enough time to lock herself in and find a way to contact help. I stumbled back towards the cabin, but the creature was relentless. It dragged itself on all fours and closed in once again. Desperate, I shouted for Kelly to keep running and not look back. The terrifying sight of the beast's twisted body kept my instincts locked in survival mode as I sprinted further away from both the cabin and safety. Another deafening crash echoed through the woods. It was clear sensing our fear only fueled its bloodlust. As we continued our frantic chase through the forest, we came across a hunting trap left by someone who had ventured into these woods before us. Driven by sheer adrenaline and panic, we attempted to use this forgotten relic against our pursuer. Hold it off! I shouted at Kelly while attempting to set the trap in place. Her gunshots continued as she provided cover fire. The creature lunged at me with gnashing teeth, but just as it thought it had me within its grasp, I shifted my weight and threw myself onto the floor forcing it to change course and stumble onto the leaves surrounding the now-activated metal jaws. It screamed, a guttural sound that sent shivers down my spine, as it fell onto the trapped shark teeth. The metallic clang resonated through the woods while its dark blood oozed around the tightening jaws. Screams resounded outside of our field of vision. Others had joined Kelly in her desperate call for help. By some miracle, assistance was not far away. An armed group of hikers had heard our cries and rushed to our aid. We could only watch as they valiantly fought to destroy the creature that nearly ended our lives. None of us dared to speak, attempting to process everything that had just occurred. Eventually, the creature was neutralized, its body charred and dismembered by a fire ignited in a controlled frenzy. Although it was difficult to believe, it seemed as though the nightmare was finally over. We banded together with those who had saved our lives and divulged the horrors we had faced. It didn't take long for speculations and analyses of this seemingly invincible creature to arise. Some guessed it might have been a mutated animal. Others pondered whether bioengineering played a part in its grotesque existence but nothing could be said with absolute certainty as theories continued being exchanged among disbelief-filled whispers. We soon turned our attention to the brave souls who paid the ultimate price battling this gruesome monstrosity. A solemn gathering assembled around a makeshift memorial, where each person shared fond memories of fallen comrades. The pain of loss brought forth from recognizing their absence weighed heavily on the mourners' hearts as they silently committed themselves to ensuring such a disaster would never happen again. Each person in attendance vowed in their hearts not to let those precious lives be lost in vain. As plans were made to ensure the safety of the forest and prevent anything similar from terrorizing its inhabitants once more, I further resolved that I too would contribute in some meaningful way. We would not forget what happened here nor would we cower in fear. 
For although we had faced an enemy unlike any other, through our trials and tribulations, we found strength and unity amidst chaos. Proof that even when facing immeasurable odds, humanity remained undeterred and capable of triumphing against darkness time and time again. I now understood that while humankind may be vulnerable alone, together we possess an unwavering spirit unparalleled in determination and resilience, able to withstand even the most formidable threats. And as we stood together around the memorial, our silence a testament to both sorrow and resolve, I couldn't help but find solace amidst collective grief, a silver lining in the gruesome ordeal that fate had thrust upon us. Ever since I moved to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, I found myself working tirelessly to maintain order in this small, humble town. As Officer Ronan Fitzwillow, I always prided myself on the relationships I built with the community, having barbecues with friends and watching football games on weekends. One Thursday, while on patrol duty during strange weather oscillating between drizzles and sunshine, I received a call through my radio about a body found in the nearby woods. The dispatcher's voice trembled, something unusual for her steady composure. Upon reaching the location, I met Officer James Mooney and Officer Cindy Colburn standing near a mutilated corpse. The gruesome scene was hard to describe. The body had its heart removed with surgical precision, and it looked drained of blood. We exchanged noticeable worry but refrained from engaging in conjecture. In the following days, more bodies turned up with similar mutilations, some missing kidneys, others without livers. Each seemed meticulously removed but other than puncture wounds near the body, there were no signs of struggle or damage to their skin. During a team meeting at the precinct, our chief tasked us with apprehending whoever was causing these devastating events. We divided into smaller groups and went searching traces of any murderous activity around town. Investigating one area of peculiar activity behind an old warehouse, I discovered footprints resembling an animal walking on two legs. Our unit converged and followed these tracks leading outside town. Conversations were tense as we began losing hope in our pursuit until we stumbled upon an old barn deep into the forested region. Peering inside carefully from a safe distance, we caught sight of something unfathomable, a grotesque humanoid creature hunched over another mutilated corpse as it gnawed at it incessantly. This monstrous being had limbs longer than any human we knew seemingly coated with a shiny substance on its thick skin that glistened under the barn's light. When it sensed our presence, it turned to face us. Noticing an empty cavity in its chest and blood-soaked teeth, we realized that this creature was feasting on human organs, possibly sustaining itself with them. Panicking, one of the officers fired a shot, striking the creature. Instead of dropping to the ground as any mortal being would, it let out an ear-piercing growl and leaped towards us with immense speed. Scrambling for cover, we desperately tried reaching our vehicles and retreated in haste. We backtracked those haunting moments at the precinct while still unable to comprehend how such a terrifying being could exist in our world. Officer Mooney suggested it must be a mutation from some unknown source possibly something we could never truly grasp without studying it further. A decision was made to inform the higher-ups and request their assistance in combating this unforeseen enemy. Unfortunately, no response or help came forth except for vague mentions of handling it internally. We couldn't be sure why they left us stranded in this predicament, but we refused to buckle under pressure. My fellow officers and I took it upon ourselves to bring an end to this calamity. Each day that passes, the tension rises as we devise new strategies and tactics, hunting this ungodly creature while remaining ever vigilant for our community's safety. 
even with all our equipment and weapons on hand. We often discuss what might happen if we land any further than exchanging bullets against this rapidly evolving beast that can effortlessly claim our lives if given a chance. Over the next few days, my fellow officers and I scoured the city for any sign of the creature. Reports came in from citizens about missing loved ones or sightings of a dark figure lurking in alleyways. It had become our obsession to hunt down this beast, which led to many sleepless nights and constant discussion among our group. With every new piece of information gathered, we found ourselves increasingly on edge. The stakes were high, not only for us but also for the community we vowed to protect. One rainy morning, after months of tracking and observing its behavior, we finally found where it seemed to have made its lair, an abandoned warehouse near the docks. Upon approaching the warehouse cautiously, we could hear sinister sounds echoing from within, sickening growls and ferocious snarling mixed with human suffering that sent shivers down our spines. We quickly broadcasted a call for backup but received no reply. Dead silence greeted us on the radio. Not waiting for help that would never arrive, we mustered our courage and entered the building ourselves, ready to face whatever unknown horrors awaited us. It was there that we encountered it once again, the creature that had terrorized our city. Its large stature stood in sharp contrast to its painfully thin body. The bones could be seen protruding through its skin in every direction like an alien forlorn skeleton. Blood and gore soaked its elongated limbs, which terminated in razor-sharp claws capable of eviscerating anything they touched without effort. We hesitated for a moment, taking in the grisly scene around it. Dismembered bodies hung from hooks on the walls, viscera strewn about like gruesome decorations. The stench of decay invaded our nostrils as we prepared to confront this abomination. While forming a rough plan of attack, one of my teammates abruptly let out a strangled cry as he was snatched away by what could only be described as a lightning-fast strike from the creature. Within mere seconds, his screams ceased, and we knew all too well that we had lost him to its monstrous appetite. The death of our comrade fueled our determination to eradicate this monster from our world. Our police training seemed to pale in comparison to what we needed to take this thing down, but we persisted. We looted away from its lair towards a large propane storage facility near the waterfront while splitting into two teams for a coordinated assault. Our tactics proved successful when the beast charged towards one group narrowly missing their evasive maneuvers, which allowed the second team to flank it and douse it with high-powered sprays of an industrial-strength acid. Agonizing cries from the creature echoed through the night as its flesh began bubbling and dissolving under the powerful chemical onslaught. We continued pursuing it relentlessly, pushing it ever closer to the propane tanks. Knowing it could not escape, it turned to face us with a defiant roar, showing every intention of taking us down with it. We acted quickly, opening fire on a nearby propane tank. The explosion engulfed both us and the creature in a raging inferno, yet miraculously, our small band of warriors managed to dive for cover just in time. As the flames died down and darkness returned, all that remained of the creature was charred fragments of bone twisted and contorted beyond recognition. In the aftermath, we mourned our losses and honored their memories as if they had fallen during wartime combat, for that indeed is what this had been, a battle against an enemy unlike any human foe. We never received any official acknowledgment or assistance from higher-ups who chose to ignore our desperate calls for help or explanations. Instead, we became jaded at these so-called defenders who abandoned us in our time of need. Life slowly returned to normalcy in our city while rumors swirled about its supernatural origins or speculative connections to secret government experiments. But as I stand in the quiet of police precinct today, 
I can't help but wonder what other unimaginable horrors still lurk in the shadows. I stroke my scars, a permanent reminder of the gruesome encounter that none of us will ever forget. Perhaps one day we'll learn the truth behind this mysterious monstrosity. Until then, our duty remains to protect our community from whatever darkness may threaten it. For me and my fellow officers, our work is never truly done. My name is Vern Malone, a small-town cop in Redstone, Colorado. Working here for over a decade, I've heard many interesting stories. Nothing prepared me for what I'd face. One morning on patrol, after nervously chewing the last piece of gum, I received a radio call regarding a missing person named Ora Grunewald. Arriving at her house, I found her husband, Ulysses, hunched and shaking. He told me his wife had vanished in the night. They have no children or close neighbors that could hear her scream for help. She just disappeared. Days later, something strange transpired. Three hikers went missing near an abandoned mine shaft. Extensive search efforts proved fruitless. Then a mutilated body of one hiker was discovered at an overlook miles from the mine shaft, with deep cuts that showed unique patterns of violence. I decided to investigate the mine shaft alone, reasoning that backup would only result in unnecessary casualties since I didn't know what we were up against. Once inside, I discovered something horrifying. A cave-welling creature hid deeper within the labyrinth passageways, frozen as a statue with stone-like exterior to blend into its surroundings. It looked like some prehistoric predator with massive jaws and sharp claws. As it unfroze itself to explore the terror that was its home, it strode with elegance which was beyond sickening. While following it discreetly through the twisting tunnels and acknowledging its strange marks left behind on rocks and bones alike, those same markings matching the unfortunate victim's corpse, I realized that this creature might be responsible for Aura's disappearance too. The creature approached a hidden chamber that contained a horde of gory remains only then did I notice its blood-smeared lips and feral eyes burning with cold malice. The air reeked with death and decay, a gruesome collection of bones and other remains inched away from the light that reached inside the chamber. Thinking about how Ulysses had reported his wife's disappearance, I couldn't help but recite a joke he told me on a previous encounter. Why didn't the phantom want to be friends with the ghost? I whispered to myself, trying to find solace amidst horror. Because they were both too argumentative, always fighting over the same sheet. Allegations aside, fate had done a cruel number on that family. I tiptoed back up to the mineshaft entrance, my mind racing. Gripping my service weapon tightly, one thought echoed above all else. Nobody should lose their loved ones this way. Amidst the shadows and fear, I vowed to put an end to this creature's vile existence. Before leaving, I gathered volatile materials from an old explosive storage. Armed and determined, I stealthily returned to the cavern where the beast resided. I found it ripping through what could only be another fresh corpse. My heart threatened to crush my chest. Its stomach-churning sight left me feeling nauseous. My plan was simple plant explosives near its den while it fed and blow it up. Even if it survived, it would never again lay claim to these caves or hunt innocent victims within Redstone again. Inching closer to execute my plan, sweat drenched down my back as I fought against terror and disgust. With explosives in hand, I started to tiptoe closer to the beast's den. My nerves were on edge, trying not to make any noise that could attract its attention. I noticed that the creature was enormous, at least twice my size. Its scaly skin was covered in dried blood, matted fur hung from parts of its body, 
and sharp fangs and claws protruded from its mouth and limbs. It was a sight from nightmares, something no one could have imagined existed in reality. I planted the explosive device near the entrance of the den and began retreating carefully. At that moment, the creature lifted its grotesque head, sniffing the air. My fear intensified, as I knew it had detected my presence. Taking a deep breath, I mustered all the courage I could find within me and whispered into my radio for backup. Redstone HQ Redstone HQ, this is Officer Daniels. I'm requesting immediate backup in the old mineshaft. My voice cracked slightly as panic built up inside me. Static responded, then a voice emerged from the other end. Roger that, Officer Daniels. Backup is on the way. Stand by. The creature appeared to sense something was off and slowly advanced toward my location. With my back against a pile of rocks on the ground, I tried to take controlled breaths. Every exhale felt like it could be my last. A faint growl echoed behind me. I recognized it as Ulysses' dog, named Brutus. The dog had escaped being tethered outside and followed me into this hellish situation. Brutus charged toward the beast as if knowing he was trying to protect his fallen master. What followed next was equally horrifying and heroic. Brutus leaped onto the creature's leg to try and slow it down, while I made a desperate run for cover to trigger the explosives. The creature roared in pain and rage, violently striking Brutus with its massive claw. Brutus' body went limp and lifeless as it hit the ground. The tragic loss of the brave dog made my resolve stronger. I detonated the explosives with anger and determination in my heart. A deafening blast echoed through the cave, a scene of destruction unfurling before me. Rubble crumbled down from the ceiling onto the creature, its roar drowning beneath the cacophony of rocks falling around it. Fiery explosions filled the air with thick, choking dust. Moments later, backup arrived, and together we ventured cautiously towards the aftermath. In the haze of dust and destruction, we caught sight of the creature's mangled body splayed across the ground. Life seemed to have left it forever, its final glare eternally frozen in pain and rage. Backup officers assisted me out of the mineshaft, while escorting Ulysses to safety. We knew this would change everything people would have questions. Scientists would examine and dissect this beast in their labs. The world might never be the same again after encountering something so inconceivable. Throughout this ordeal, I kept thinking about Ulysses' joke about ghosts and phantoms, a small comfort amidst a horrific experience. The memory reminded me how widely different our lives were mere days ago. Now back on steady ground outside that wretched cave, I stopped to look back at what had transpired inside those mineshafts. Here we had witnessed tragedy, heroism, and even triumph amidst terror. As I turned to leave one last time, I couldn't help but think of Brutus, his loyalty to Ulysses driving him to face an undefeatable beast. No amount of valor could replace what was lost— not just for me or Ulysses, but for all those who had suffered in our community. We mourned for them all knowing that from this day forward, our lives would never be the same. I stood at the edge of a crime scene in Pine Barrens, New Jersey. I introduced myself to the other officers. Hey, I'm Officer Enoch Brindley. They nodded their appreciation. People from the nearby town had reported strange events happening in these woods, which had turned into missing persons cases that gradually piled up. As a small-town cop, this wasn't something I usually deal with, but today was different. We found the tenth victim today. Still no obvious cause of death, 
but each covered in cruel and disgusting cuts and bite marks. The remote location made help slower to arrive than we'd like, and we still hadn't connected all the dots. My childhood experiences hunting with my father flashed through my mind as I surveyed the scene. I noticed faint tracks leading away from the body not human footprints but something else. I cautiously followed the trail. My heart began to pound in my chest as I realized these tracks were eerily similar to the ones found previously. This couldn't only be a coincidence. As we ventured deeper into the forest, we came across a dilapidated wooden cabin. The air was stale and heavy with an odd smell that made it difficult to breathe. The door creaked open as I pushed it cautiously. It was dark inside and harder to see what occupied this derelict housing, but we had little choice but to explore. Inside the cabin lay countless mangled belongings of previous victims scattered amongst bones. These belongings coupled with the dangerous situation brought forth immense unease across us all. Suddenly, an immense growl shook the floor beneath our feet as if sensing our presence. It was clear we were not alone anymore. From behind one of the broken-down walls emerged a horrific creature. It looked like an amalgamation of several creatures combined into one terrifying being, part wolf-like entity and part humanoid monstrosity. It lunged straight at us with speed I could scarcely comprehend, its jaw snapping open wide to reveal rows of razor-sharp teeth. I fired my gun rapidly, the bullets penetrating the beast's thick hide, but it didn't even flinch. Outmatched and overpowered, we ran from the cabin back into the woods, shouting at each other, desperate to reach safety. The creature tirelessly chased us through the trees, stalking our every move as we desperately tried to evade it. Help! Please, somebody! One of my fellow officers screamed. But there was no one around to hear us. Our voices carried far in the empty forest until they faded away as high-pitched echoes. While running for our lives, we split up, a decision I prayed would spare at least a few of us. My heart raced as I bounded through branches and undergrowth. In this dire situation, I found myself leaping over fallen trees and dodging branches as I sprinted through the dark forest. Sweat poured down my face and filled my eyes, making it even harder to see where I was going. The monstrous howling grew louder behind me, a macabre symphony of terror that echoed throughout the woods. I knew that whatever chance of rescue we had before was rapidly dwindling. The creature's pursuit had left us with no time to call for help, and as we had escaped from that hideous cabin, it seemed like our only option was to keep moving, otherwise, we would surely become its next victims. As I stumbled into a small clearing, I realized I had lost sight of my fellow officers in the chaos. Panic set in as I called out for them, only to be answered by the bone-chilling growl of the creature that still hunted us relentlessly. Just when I thought all hope was lost, I saw a faint glimmer of headlights in the distance. A narrow dirt road. Perhaps we hadn't veered too far off course after all. Gasping for breath, I started down the path towards the promise of salvation. Along the way, I discovered Officer Thompson leaning against the tree trunk, clutching his leg in pain. We have to keep going, Thompson! I shouted. We can't let that thing catch up to us. Thompson nodded and gingerly rose to his feet. We limped along as fast as we could manage until finally spotting an old ranger station looming ahead. It wasn't much but offered enough security for us to muster remaining reserves of strength and make a desperate phone call for backup. We managed to seal ourselves inside and hastily blockade the door just as the creature arrived at our refuge. It scratched and clawed at the wooden walls with unexpected ferocity, but remained unsuccessful in breaching our makeshift stronghold. We need to hold out a little longer, Thompson urged. Help's on the way. 
Hours passed, and the creature's attacks gradually began to wane. Eventually, the howling ceased altogether, replaced by the distant sirens of approaching police cars and the heavy thud of helicopters overhead. Backup arrived just as dawn began to break, and daylight revealed the mutilated corpse of what was once a fearsome predator. Surprisingly, it appeared far more lifeless and pathetic in the morning light a twisted mass of fur, claws, and gnarled limbs sprawled in an undignified heap. The investigators would later conclude that it was a previously unknown species with several unique adaptations that allowed it to hunt relentlessly without rest, until its eventual capture. Driven to near extinction by humans encroaching on its habitat, it somehow found itself drawn to that desolate cabin where grisly remnants of past victims taunted it with memories of past feasts. As we were finally rescued from our ordeal and loaded onto stretchers for medical treatment, I spared one last glance at our fallen comrades' final resting places. Their valiant efforts would never be forgotten, etched into our minds as we continued the long road back towards sanity. In solemn silence, we departed from that nightmarish forest where we had faced untold horrors now mere stories in the annals of our lives. Our scars would heal as time moved on but served as permanent reminders of our encounter with a ferocious creature born from nature's darkest shadows, stalking silently and viciously in pursuit of its prey. It was a quiet day in Eldridge, a small town in Iowa, as I patrolled the streets in my squad car. I'm Tim Lindbergh, and I had been a cop in this community for about two years, after serving five years in the military. Life here was usually uneventful. It was peaceful, and people knew each other well. As I drove around, I turned left towards a wooded area that led to the outskirts of the town. Something drew me to explore this region today, call it instinct, or just gut feeling. I saw a man running towards me, panic-stricken. Desperately heaving and out of breath, he waved me down. I stopped the car and rolled down the window. Officer! My wife, she's gone! We were taking a hike when we stumbled upon something, horrifying by the river! Pieces of human flesh and bones strewn all over. We tried to call for help but there was no reception. Gasped Kurt Bentley between breaths. Without wasting a second, I sprang into action, radioing my backup with our location as Kurt shared more details. When we reached the scene, uneasiness crawled beneath my skin as it lived up to every bit of Kurt's description. Suddenly... Rustling nearby caught our attention. Panic surged through us. The underbrush revealed a grotesque sight, an eight-foot-tall creature lumbering towards us, reptilian scales covering its body with massive wings seeming to sprout from its back. It charged at us with remarkable speed for something of its size. With laser-sharp focus and adrenaline racing through my veins— I drew my gun out and fired several rounds at it hoping to take it down or give us enough time to escape. Its cold eyes never flinched as bullets struck its body, seemingly invulnerable to guns and most likely other weapons too. Anger intensified in its gaze as it continued to charge. Now, only inches away and with no backup, survival instincts kicked in as I grabbed Kurt and sprang out of its way barely missing the torrent of gnashing teeth. It crashed into the ground like a wrecking ball. With no time to spare, we scrambled to our feet, clutching the sidearm as if it was our lifeline. My experience from the military increased my steadiness somewhat as we ran, leaping through the woods like desperate gazelles with predator hot on our heels. Before long, I found myself lost in its twisted hunger for flesh and blood. One thing was for sure, we could not outrun this creature for much longer. Out of options and with the life-threatening situation at hand, 
I spotted Eldridge's water tower nearby about 150 feet tall. It was our last hope to escape. Kurt and I raced towards the water tower, climbing up the ladder as quickly as we could. The facility seemed to have been abandoned for years with most equipment collecting dust and vines rotting away in rusty decay. With each heartbeat resonating through my chest in deafening intensity, I knew it was do or die at this point. And all I had faith in were my instincts honed with experience over years of service in law enforcement and military. Enveloped in desperation, I reached into my back pocket to find a flare, a brilliant idea sparked within. It was time for me to ward off our monster using everything that I learned during a training session on controlling an aggressive animal. Hoping that mere flares might provide temporary protection before being consumed by this seemingly immortal beast, I struck the flare causing it to sizzle into life, igniting a fiery beacon of hope. The creature had found us once more. Time had run out on immediate help arriving or finding another way out of this nightmare scenario. As it lunged forward towards us, I thrust the flare against its face hoping to force it back even by sheer surprise or momentary blindness. The flare burned brightly, illuminating the creature's hideous face. It recoiled briefly, howling in pain and rage. Its features were a grotesque combination of human and animal, with a distorted mouth filled with sharp teeth meant for ripping and tearing flesh. Its eyes were almost human-like but filled with a burning hatred that sent chills down my spine. Kurt shouted over the creature's sinister howls, We need to do something. We can't stay here forever. His voice wavered but his determination remained strong despite the circumstances. With no other option and little time to spare, I yelled back. I'll try to signal for help with the flare. Keep an eye on that thing while I do it. As Kurt hesitated for a moment before nodding his agreement, I climbed higher up the water tower's ladder. I knew we couldn't count on help arriving quickly, but trying was better than doing nothing at all. Holding the flare at arm's length above my head, I waved it back and forth while keeping one hand on the ladder for support. What is that thing? Kurt called out from below. I don't know. I shouted back. But whatever it is, we have to assume it won't stop hunting us unless we find a way to stop it or get far away from here. As I attempted to signal for help, the creature began climbing the water tower after us. Its powerful limbs made quick work of the ascent as it seemingly ignored the damage done by the flare earlier. Kurt began kicking it in desperation, landing several solid blows to its monstrous face. It snarled viciously and relentlessly continued its pursuit. Stop! Kurt screamed at it but his pleas were met with more aggression as its powerful claw lashed out at Kurt's leg causing him unbearable pain in an instant. My heart pounded as I watched my friend hurt, but there was no time for sympathy. The creature was closing in. By some stroke of luck, the flare's light caught the attention of a nearby police officer. His car screeched to a halt, sirens blaring, next to our makeshift battlefield. Get down! I've called for backup, he shouted. Knowing we had no other choice, Kurt and I scrambled down the ladder as fast as we could while the creature roared at the prospect of losing its prey. Once on solid ground, the brave officer did his best to hold back the beast as we ran to safety. Others joined him once they reached the scene, forming a defensive line against the terror pursuing us. As we retreated to safety, engulfed in chaos and surrounded by the sound of gunfire and howls of pain from both the creature and its attackers, Kurt's injury became obvious. You're hurt, I told him gently as sweat mixed with blood dripped from his brow. I'll be fine, he replied through gritted teeth. At least we made it out alive. We both knew that things could have ended differently. 
there had been victims before us, innocent people who met their violent ends by this relentless hunter. Pieces of their existence flashed before me, partially eaten bodies on the outskirts of town that horrified first responders and left families devastated. As we reached safety and waited anxiously for news about the creature, Kurt looked at me solemnly. What are we going to do now? Vengeance was evident in his eyes. The abomination had hurt him physically and mentally. I'm not sure, I admitted. But one thing is clear. We won't rest until this thing is stopped. In that moment, standing side by side with my friend amidst uncertainty and fear, what remained unsaid was just as important as what was spoken aloud. The unknown beast had enemies now, too. I'm Officer Chuck McAllister, a small-town cop in Jasper, Alabama. My days generally involve settling petty disputes and patrolling the streets. Sometimes I joke how my life's as exciting as a drying paint. But that drastically changed on that fateful day. Just as I was about to enjoy my lunch break, I received a call about a disturbance near a construction site, near the town's lake. Upon arriving, I came across horrified workers claiming they found something disturbing buried while excavating. Carefully treading closer, my eyes met the most gruesome sight, dismembered human body parts strewn all over. I've never seen anything like it, said one worker, Rex O'Leary. He gasped as I examined the remains. I need everyone to step back and call for backup. I instructed. Surrounding the area with caution tape, I radioed for help while we held the scene. There was fear and tension in the air as everyone whispered among themselves. Some spoke of an old legend a creature in the lake they hadn't seen for decades. I don't usually believe them stories, Rex confessed sheepishly. But no human could do this. As forensics arrived later to collect evidence, and remove the remains, we advised workers to be cautious near the lake. The response seemed subdued despite what we uncovered today. Weeks passed since the incident, and even though things seemingly returned to normalcy, anxiety rested firmly in our hearts. Then it happened again. An abandoned car belonging to Nelson Pinson was found by the lake with traces of blood smeared inside. Missing persons reports multiplied like wildfire after that day each bearing frightening similarities to one another. Every victim was last seen by telephone booths close to the lake or on dimly lit pathways nearby. A chilling pattern emerged and although skeptical about mythical legends, evidence compelled me to reconsider. The creature from folklore silently wormed its way into reality stalking and hunting unsuspecting souls. Whether it was intentional or born out of necessity remained a baffling mystery. Stakeouts became a common occurrence. Radio crackled and senses sharpened whenever an eerie silence enveloped the area. Fellow officers like Officer Francine Trent, a seasoned cop with a no-nonsense attitude, remained cool-headed throughout but admitted to feeling perturbed at night. Why not call in for reinforcements? I asked her one evening as we patrolled the area around the lake. Francine shrugged. Fear of going public, maybe? Imagine if word on this reached other towns and painted us as sitting ducks. Though reasonable, I couldn't shake off the uncertainty that gnawed at me like a relentless itch. We were in unknown territory and outnumbered at every turn. During one of my patrol shifts, I saw movement near the edge of the forest by the lake. Carefully creeping forward with flashlight outstretched and firearm ready, my eyes caught sight of an imposing silhouette crouched near water's edge. It seemed unaware of my presence, or so I thought. Before I could radio for help, it suddenly whirled around to face me with lightning-fast speed. 
its body long and sinewy like serpent, and possibly fast movements barely visible under moonlight. Fierce eyes glowed hungrily as they locked on its next prey, me. Knowing that running would be futile, I stood my ground and raised my gun, only to have it snatched away from my grasp by one violent swoop of its massive limb. A deathly silence settled in as we eyed each other coldly, each assessing the other's strengths and vulnerabilities. Without further hesitation, I called out to Francine, my voice cracking with urgency. Francine! Back up now! The monstrous creature's focus momentarily shifted to the sound of my distress call, and its limbs tensed as though preparing to flee. Not so fast, yelled Francine, sprinting out from behind a tree. Her gun aimed squarely at the beast as she demanded it freeze. But it seemed intent on escape and survival. With forceful undulations, it slithered into the woods with incredible speed. We both gave chase but quickly lost sight of the creature. Stopping at the tree lean, we glanced about in an effort to locate it. Every rustle of leaves or snapping twig heightened our senses as we combed through the darkness. That's when we heard a blood-curdling scream. The two of us raced back to our patrol car and decided our pursuit was best continued with backup. We radioed other officers within range to join us by the lake immediately. As they arrived, we quickly brought them up to speed on what had transpired. I think I've seen something similar before, remarked Officer Jim Thompson, an older officer with decades of experience. It had a different shape but moved just as quickly and elusively. His words provoked murmurs of agreement and concern among other officers. It was unsettling to know this wasn't an isolated encounter. Quickly, a plan was formed. Our department would oversee the investigation until wildlife specialists could take over. The town should be made aware of possible danger from local wildlife, but without causing widespread panic by describing the grotesque unknown creature. The following days were filled with heightened tension and night patrols around the lake. The creature avoided any confrontation. Its existence remained unconfirmed beyond our initial sighting. Two days later, while I was off duty resting at home, Officer Thompson was found brutally mauled. Twisted vines protruded from his chest, limbs mangled beyond recognition. The grisly sight of his corpse chilled us all to the core. After this gruesome attack, authorities decided we could no longer keep the information to ourselves. A press conference was held to release and request any relevant knowledge. The collective terror spread through the town. Residents barricaded themselves indoors after sunset, and schools were closed indefinitely as the search for the creature continued with no success. Wildlife specialists finally arrived at our station. When briefed on the events surrounding the unknown creature, they were puzzled and unable to shed light on its origin or species. However, one suggested it could be a genetic mutation resulting from human interference or pollution in the environment. These factors remained open for speculation. Days later, residents grew restless, demanding action and resolution. With heavy hearts and guns ready, Fellow officers and I returned to patrol duties in hope of encountering this elusive monster again. Each night was tense as we maintained our vigilance around town. One evening, while patrolling near an abandoned warehouse by the lake, I saw the creature once more. Luminous eyes stared back at me as limbs twitched below, almost tempting me to pursue it again. This time, though, I remained in place and radioed my colleagues. Quickly coordinating our efforts, we surrounded the warehouse where it had retreated. Its escape was impossible. An air of finality settled in as we prepared ourselves for confrontation. Suddenly, with a deafening crash from within the building, the roof collapsed from its weight before it swiftly slithered out and burst through a side entrance. 
officers fired relentlessly upon its exposed figure. Limbs flailed in agony before recoiling toward its body as life slowly drained away. With each round endured for what felt like an eternity, an eerie silence finally took hold. The creature's terrible toll on our town came to a desperate end. I gazed at its mangled body, its destruction both cathartic and bittersweet. This gruesome predator was finally slain, but it had claimed lives that would never return. The aftermath left us to wonder about its exact origin— those questions remained unanswered. We merely assumed it was an anomaly, a tragedy brought upon us through unthinkable circumstances. As the sun rose on our broken town, we mourned those whose lives were stolen and began rebuilding together with determination never to forget their sacrifices. And whenever I now hear of unexplained phenomena or strange occurrences— I remember the terror that once gripped our quiet lakeside community and hope never to encounter such an adversary again. I'm Officer Rupert Kingstone, and I've been working as a small-town cop for over a decade now. It's mostly quiet here in Pine Valley, a sleepy town tucked away in the mountains of rural Montana. But when things go south, you can count on me to get to the bottom of it. Today started off normal enough, responding to noise complaints and domestic disputes. My partner, Rosalind Smythe, and I patrolled the town, exchanging sarcastic remarks whenever we had the chance. However, one call came through that changed everything an unusual assault case down by the lake. As Rosalind and I arrived at the scene, we found Christine Wellington with cuts and bruises all over her body. She was in shock. It was massive. She muttered to herself. What attacked you? I asked. I don't know, she whispered with dread. Eager to learn more but wary of Christine's fragile state. I sent her to the hospital for further examination. Rosalind and I investigated near the lake. A trail of blood led us into the woods where we noticed broken branches and trampled vegetation, all signs of a hasty retreat or pursuit. Shining our flashlights across the area, we tried not to let our imagination run wild. We had heard bizarre stories— a creature stalking Pine Valley for generations, but those were just urban legends, things spooked kids would tell around campfires. Nothing more. At least that's what I wanted to believe. As we ventured deeper into the forest, we found what appeared to be claw marks etched into tree trunks, unnervingly deep gouges some six feet off the ground. We exchanged uneasy glances before moving on. Up ahead, several yellow crime scene markers signified we had arrived at another area of interest. A blackened circle of burned grass was unmistakable, evidence of a fireball that didn't naturally occur in these parts. At this point, I couldn't deny that there were many strange occurrences happening in Pine Valley. We emerged from the woods onto an old dirt road where a truck was abandoned. From a distance, we observed Leonard Marsh, the tow truck driver we'd called for backup earlier, trembling in the driver's seat. I approached cautiously, windows wide open. Leonard, are you all right? Officer Kingstone, he stuttered. Something monstrous attacked me just as I arrived here. My concern turned to fear as I struggled to process his words. Another victim? Our search area just got bigger. Suddenly, we heard a blood-curdling scream coming from the direction of the lake. Rosalind and I sprinted towards the source only to discover a nightmare unfolding. We found Marie Fletcher from our search party lying unconscious near the edge of the water with her leg horribly mangled and other searchers frantically trying to stem the bleeding. There was no sign of the creature— just destruction left in its wake. 
Rosalind called for backup while I continued my search around the lake, feeling an ever-deepening unease and urgency to protect my town from whatever was lurking out there. An eerie silence swallowed Pine Valley as darkness fell, cloaking everything in a dense fog. The air grew colder. The shadows deepened among the trees, hiding whatever terror lay hidden within them. Hours passed without sight or sound of the creature until finally desperate screams broke through the enveloping quietude, the unmistakable sound of lives being torn apart at their seams. Heart-clenching with dread, I sprinted once more in pursuit of this nightmarish antagonist toward a lone house illuminated by lights on Hughes Street. As I reached the house, I banged on the door, hoping that the terrified occupants would call for help. Help! Call the police and tell them to send back up! I shouted repeatedly. There was no response. The door was unlocked, so I let myself in. Inside I found a horrifying scene. Furniture overturned, blood smeared on the walls, and two bodies lying on the floor, mangled beyond recognition. I tried not to think about their agony and focused on finding any wounded survivors. As I searched the house, I found a young man hiding in a closet. He was shaking uncontrollably with terror but appeared uninjured. What happened? I asked. Did you see the creature? He nodded, tears streaming down his face. It. It was massive. He stuttered covered in black fur with huge yellow eyes, massive claws. I don't know what it was, but it was horrifying. I led him outside as he recounted his encounter with the creature responsible for this bloodbath. The gruesome details he shared shook me to my core. By now, additional police officers had arrived at the scene. Rosalind quickly filled them in on what we'd discovered at the lake. She then whispered to me that Marie from our search team had died from her injuries. My heart sank. I started organizing search groups with extreme urgency to find this predator responsible for shattering our town's peace and safety. Also, others comforted traumatized witnesses like the young man we found earlier. We combed every inch of Pine Valley for days without finding any trace of the creature that haunted our nightmares and left so much devastation in its wake. Finally, after five days of terror and sleepless nights, we received a tip from a farmer who claimed to have seen a lurking monster near an old abandoned barn on his property. Aching with exhaustion but determined to put an end to this nightmare, I gathered a group of armed officers and volunteers to investigate. As we approached the barn, we heard chilling growls echoing from within its dark, looming walls. We cautiously entered, flashlights illuminating the darkness ahead. There it was, a massive creature resembling a wolf but much larger, eyes glowing menacingly and massive claws dripping with blood. The creature snarled, baring its vicious teeth as it fixed its deadly gaze upon us. Heart pounding in my chest, I raised my gun, taking aim at the monster intending to fire. But in an instant, the creature lunged toward us with alarming speed and power. Gunshots rang out in panic as we scattered in all directions. Two officers were caught by its heinous claws one losing his life immediately as he was mauled viciously. The other sustained severe injuries but managed to escape. The creature retreated deeper into the barn as more officers arrived on sight, securing the area and calling for backup with tranquilizer guns. Hours later, a specialized team of animal control experts subdued and captured the monstrous creature. Upon closer examination, they concluded it resembled a wolf, an extraordinarily large one, but showed some unusual physical characteristics that they couldn't explain without conducting further research. Questions still swirled. What was this terrifying predator? Where had it come from? What had driven it to kill so brutally? 
We may never truly know all the answers but did our best to put Pine Valley back together after these horrifying events. Memorials were held for those who lost their lives. Marie Fletcher from our search team, the two victims in that house on Hughes Street, and the officer killed during the capture. Though generations may pass as memories fade, Pine Valley will never forget what once terrorized us, united us, and made us stronger than before. This menacing enigma that forever remains etched in our town's somber history. It was one of those nights when the sky just won't stop pouring, the kind that made folks here in Haskell County, Kansas, prefer staying indoors. As Officer Rupert Yalowix, I had no such luxury. Patrolling the streets was part of my job, and that meant braving through the temperamental weather. My parents hailed from a tiny Eastern European village. They immigrated to the U.S., winding up in Haskell County where I'd been born and raised. The narrative thread of our lives seemed to seamlessly sync with the town's humdrum existence. Despite its idiosyncrasies, it was a place we were proud to call home. The dispatch radio crackled to life, breaking the silence. Officer Yalowix, we've got a 10 to 16 at Horseshoe Park. Can you check it out? Responding affirmatively, I steered my patrol car toward Horseshoe Park, situated on the edge of town. A series of eerie disappearances had hallowed this scenic escape into Haskell County's urban legend. With dense woods encircling its playground and lakefront path, it made for an unsettling crime scene. Spotlighting my surroundings upon reaching the park, there she lay, Carenza Dunkirk, a local woman covered in lacerations. She appeared lifeless. I hurriedly called for an ambulance while checking her vitals. Luckily, she still had a pulse. Who did this to you? I asked gently when she regained her senses for brief moments. Carenza struggled to describe her attacker, an enormous creature with razor-sharp talons and teeth like jagged knives. Delirious from pain and shock, she couldn't say more before slipping back into unconsciousness. I suddenly noticed smeared blood and muddy prints leading further into the woods, a trail left by the attacker. With haste and trepidation, I radioed my colleagues for backup. Barely ten minutes had passed when Officer Tristana Hogg reached my location. I filled her in on the situation as we navigated deeper into the underbrush guided by the twisted footprints. Our hearts raced with each step. Haskell County had never witnessed anything remotely similar. Behind a thick cluster of trees, we found an abandoned farmhouse, boarded up from decades of neglect. Approaching cautiously, we spotted crude scratch marks on the wooden boards and dismantled doors. Inside the decaying structure, a ghastly tableau awaited, half-eaten human remains scattered among memories of a family no more. My stomach churned at the stench hanging heavy in the air. Tristana checked her weapons as I hesitantly inspected blood-covered slips of paper. The garbled scribblings mentioned something about a beast born from experiments in nature and nurture gone awry, human flesh seemingly its sole sustenance. The building quivered, and our hearts jolted with fear. Heavy footsteps approached as if echoing our imminent fate. Preparing for confrontation with this monster tormenting Haskell County, we armed ourselves with steadfast determination. Through the splintered doorway, it emerged, a nightmarish beast standing over nine feet tall with muscular arms that ended in lethally curved claws. Its aura screamed murderous intent as it stalked closer, closing the distance between predator and prey. Not one to back down without putting up a fight, I steeled my nerves and aimed my pistol squarely at this abominable creature. Our lives now rested on execution rather than hesitation. There'd be no room for mistakes. Tristana and I exchanged a glance, 
knowing we had to act fast. The beast lunged towards us, its claws extended and ready to tear through our flesh. I fired a shot at it, and miraculously it recoiled from the impact. Using this opportunity, we sprinted towards the rear exit of the farmhouse. We dashed through the underbrush, our hearts pounding with each stride. Our surroundings became a blur as we raced to escape the creature pursuing us. Cell reception! We need to call for help! Tristana shouted over the sound of our heavy breathing. I pulled my phone out, cursing its lack of signal. The nearest town was miles away, but we had no choice but to get as far from the nightmare chasing us as possible. Expending our remaining energy, we pressed on in a desperate attempt to survive. We finally stumbled upon a road, feeling the slightest hint of safety creeping back into our minds. Glancing behind us revealed no sign of the monstrosity bent on ending us, at least for now. Horrified and distraught by what we had seen and lost, we knew we needed help. In the distance, headlights appeared as a car approached. We flagged it down and collapsed into the back seat once the driver stopped for us. In between gasps for air, I managed to explain our predicament without dwelling on the gory details. To my surprise, he took our account seriously and sped towards town while Tristana dialed emergency services on his phone. Paramedics arrived at our location soon after we reached town and took over our care. Our injuries were treated while I described everything, except for how unnaturally this creature came into existence, to an officer recording our statements. Days passed since that frightening encounter with authorities combing through Haskell County in search of what had so aggressively hunted us down. There was reasonable doubt about our testimony, but the undisputable truth lay in that dilapidated farmhouse— the mutilated human remains offering undeniable evidence of a voracious predator. The search yielded little aside from discovering more victims, but a ghastly reality sank in as we digested the facts. The creature had been relentless, driven by insatiable hunger for human flesh. There was only guesswork to explain its origin. Perhaps it was the result of forbidden experiments gone awry. Or maybe nature decided to manifest a new predatory monster seemingly designed for one purpose, to dominate humanity. Tristana and I were survivors amidst horrifying tragedy, and we could not stray far from that fact. We knew our lives would never be the same. How could they be after facing something so perverse? The fallen had no names or faces— their fates forever bound with an unthinkable menace. Our nightmare did not cease with its eventual demise. The beast was caught weeks later in a trap laid by authorities with the support of renowned wildlife hunters. Examination of the carcass revealed it bore similarities to no known species on earth, thus leaving us only to assume its enigmatic existence. With the creature's capture and extermination— Haskell County mourned their lost kin and community members. The gruesome reality of our ordeal would weigh heavily on our hearts, but as survivors we swore to honor those taken by this twisted manifestation of evil. Years have passed since the nightmare in Haskell County, a scar left on time, but with resilience and unity, we rebuilt what was lost." We may never fully understand why fate led us down such a brutal path. Nevertheless, our journey serves as a harrowing reminder of life's inexplicable cruelty and its fierce determination for survival. I'm Officer Jed Montgomery, a cop in the small isolated town of Hummingbird Falls, nestled within the dense Appalachian Mountains. I patrol the quiet streets where everyone knows each other and their names. So when Aldrich Zimmerman went missing, I felt it deep down. It was a routine afternoon at work when his wife Amaris frantically phoned the station. 
officer, you remember my husband, Aldrich? He's been missing since early morning. Of course, Amaris, those enchiladas he made for the town cookout were fantastic. It's our duty to help. Don't worry, I assured her. I began questioning folks around town. People mentioned they'd seen Aldrich working near the old kale mine that morning. The mine had been abandoned since the seismic event years ago, unexplained rumblings beneath the town that shook and frightened residents for days. My curiosity piqued. I decided to investigate further. I made my way to the mine's entrance where darkness swallowed earth and an eerie air caged me in. Headlamp affixed, I entered cautiously. An hour into solo exploration, with no end in sight and no sign of Aldrich, fear began settling within me like sediment. But I recalled my life as a child and my mother's voice comforting me whenever I'd been afraid of the dark. Soothing, familiar memories gave me the strength to forge ahead. Then I stumbled upon it, Aldrich's flashlight on a rocky outcrop and a hidden opening ahead it pointed towards. A fortuitous find or Aldrich's salvation? The unknown beckoned. My hesitation disintegrated as rapidly as my resolve solidified. The narrow tunnel led to a larger cavern housing discarded mining equipment, antiquated props reminiscent of another time, and much more recent belongings, funerary items of no value, an old watch beside rotting fruit, an eerie ablation or inexplicable offering. The chamber widened, stench-like decay intermingled with earth embraced me. Pools of dried crimson fluid littered the ground and introduced a dreadlace thought. My discovery could have revealed a brutal macabre fate for the missing townsfolk. Nearby, another hole, older, concealed in shadows and large enough for passage. My heart pounded like war drums, insisting I investigate further. This ancient gash cut into the rock took me deeper until I encountered an immense, vaulted underwater cavern. Astonishing phosphorescent fauna melded nature with mystique akin to a forgotten land. Sight and sound merged. Reverberations from drops echoed like thunder drums through the cave. Stifling fear tickling my spine. I waded through chilling subterranean waters until they welcomed an alcove detaching from the main cavern, a home away from home or something more sinister. Deep footprints marked its entrance, some human, others unnaturally broad and reminiscent of a clawed footprint fused with man. I gazed forward to where Aldrich's vest lay amongst torn remnants of clothing. Suddenly jarring and guttural growls broke the silence. My breath hitched as adrenaline surged through me. A dark form emerged from its lair, its features slowly materializing. A monstrous abomination it was, part human, part reptilian creature coated in gruesome scales with piercing yellow eyes that seemed to see into my soul. Yellowed teeth splayed behind its snarling maw, deadly intent radiated like midday sun rays. I backpedaled, desperate to escape the creature's wrath. I glanced at the entrance of the alcove, debating whether I should call for help. Adrenaline coursed through my veins like liquid fire. The fear of becoming its next victim overpowered my desire to warn others. The creature lunged, its massive scaled arms flailing wildly. I narrowly evaded its grasp, heart pounding. With all my remaining strength, I hurried through the chilling subterranean waters toward the exit of the cave system. The monstrous creature's guttural growls grew louder and more aggressive as it pursued me relentlessly. My entire body trembled, yet somehow, I managed to keep pushing forward. At last, I saw a faint glimmer of sunlight at the edge of the cave entrance. With panic driving me onward, I lunged forward and stumbled out of the cave onto solid ground once again. The creature's guttural snarls grew into a cacophony of enraged shrieks as it thrashed within the shadowy cavern's confines. Exhausted, 
I forced myself to stand on shaky legs and began to sprint away from the maw of hell that threatened to consume me. My mind raced with thoughts of what had transpired. Aldrich's vest among torn clothing. Those footprints. Were they recent? The haunting image of the abomination that bore scales like armor and those yellow teeth. It ultimately sealed my resolve not to draw more innocent lives into this nightmare. As fast as my legs could carry me, I navigated through dense forest terrain, an effort made more challenging since I knew nothing of these woods or what lay ahead. The guttural growls slowly faded behind me. However, any relief felt by their absence was stifled by an insidious presence lurking in every shadow that crossed my path. Eventually unable to ignore the ache in my limbs any longer nor the sharp pain that stabbed at my lungs with each ragged breath, I stopped near a secluded area near a riverbank. Though my body craved rest, primal instincts screamed that stopping now would ultimately lead to demise. My thoughts returned to the creature, its physical form a vivid image seared into my memory. Yellow eyes shining like lanterns in darkness pierced my very soul, and its snarling fang more resonated vividly. The sheer size and power of this monstrosity spurred an ominous realization. Either the missing townsfolk nor Aldric stood a chance against such overwhelming odds. Guilt, cold and heavy like the murky river before me, settled in my gut, guilt for escaping when others had not. I scanned the surrounding area for any evidence of others who might have fled the creature and emerged in this very location. As if answering my prayers, I spotted two figures huddled together beneath a towering oak tree. Approaching them cautiously, I recognized them as the town's blacksmith and his daughter. Their faces were pale and drawn, fatigue etched into every line. The blacksmith whispered to me as I neared, we saw the creature. We won't speak of it again. With reinforced conviction in our shared silence and understanding of potential heartache awaiting any who knew of this terror we faced, I realized one truth. Divulging what had transpired within those ancient caverns teeming with phosphorescent light would only unleash chaos upon any who remain ignorant to their hideous depths. My promise settled upon one irrefutable fact. No person must suffer as we had nor hear of horrors that would prey upon their thoughts each time they closed their eyes. As we three survivors turned our backs on the cave's dark secret that day, relief washed over us, a bittersweet oasis birthed from secrets too terrible to share yet too dangerous to ignore completely forever. This path chosen... Embracing silence and potential isolation from those outside this protective circle weighed heavily with each step we took away from our ordeal. And with this new pact, we walked away in search of finding some semblance of life normalcy once more. I just finished my shift when I got a call from Tobias Crenshaw, the town's mechanic. Officer Boonru gone. I found something on my property you need to come and see. Arriving at Tobias' property, I was stunned by the sight before me, a massive, twisted tree with a body hanging from it. The victim was Axel Fredericks, a loner who lived on the outskirts of Madley, Vermont. Tara Noonan, our paramedic, was inspecting the scene. What do you think? I asked her. Definitely murder, Tara responded with a grim tone. Some kind of rope-like device around his neck. As a small-town cop in Madley, I rarely encountered anything worse than petty theft. This chilling scene sent my heart racing. Tobias tugged at his overalls. You think it's like that movie about murderous creatures? He asked nervously. Don't you worry about that, Tob, I replied. We'll figure this out. Days went by as we searched for clues and questioned the townspeople to no avail. Then we received another call. 
this time from Tasha Sinclair from Madley Elementary School. A janitor named Vernon Quinton was brutally attacked, torn limb from limb in the school gymnasium. I remembered Vernon as my high school classmate who never left Madley after graduation, but his gruesome death painted an image nobody would forget. Boon! Mayor Winslow approached me nervously. The people are getting anxious. We need something done. I promise we're doing everything we can. I insisted. That evening, while patrolling Oakwood Cemetery, I came face to face with an unsettling creature. Its muscular form was covered in greenish-black scales and it had powerful jaws capable of tearing flesh with ease. I whipped out my gun as it unleashed a deafening roar before rapidly slithering away. I called for backup, but they arrived too late. This sinister new enemy continued terrorizing madly, leaving us to find more carnage in their wake. A telephone repairman eviscerated, a teacher's spine ripped from her torso. It was during a stakeout at Kingswood Park that things took a turn for the worse. Amber Hendricks, our clerk at the station and my close friend, volunteered to come along as backup. As we exchanged stories of Madley's past, scuffling sounds reached our ears. We followed them into a dense thicket to find the creature hunched over something, or someone. Amber couldn't hold back a choked gasp that gave away our position. The creature turned its horrible gaze on us. I fired my weapon, but it merely hissed in anger. Run! I shouted at Amber as the creature lunged toward us. We narrowly escaped back into the park where we'd come across another body, Yolanda Parkins, an accountant from City Hall. Mayor Winslow called for an emergency town meeting to deal with the crisis. Boone, we have to stop this monster before it destroys our town, he implored with panic in his eyes. My plans to trap the creature would require convincing every resident of Madley to work together. A nearly impossible task, but nonetheless, I had to try. We established perimeters around the town and set various traps, hoping one would catch our elusive adversary. Days went by without success while tensions rose among my neighbors. Even Amber lost confidence in me. Boon, she sighed one night. I don't know how much longer the townspeople can hold on. But despite all odds and despair reigning over madly, I refused to give up. It was during another patrol near Tobias Crenshaw's property that an electrifying sensation shot through me, the sickening feeling of being hunted. In my peripheral vision, I spotted the creature creeping closer. With my heart pounding and adrenaline fueling me, I pulled out my gun and aimed. It was a showdown between a small-town cop and a monstrosity, an unlikely battle that would determine the fate of Madley. I took a deep breath and squeezed the trigger, releasing a bullet towards the creature. It screeched as the bullet grazed its tough, leathery hide. It paused for a moment, seemingly confused by the attack. I could see its large, yellow eyes locked onto mine staring with an intense malevolence. Its long arms extended, showing off claws that dripped with blood. I barely managed to dodge its swipe toward me, feeling the wind from the close call on my face. My gun now useless, I dropped it and yelled into my walkie-talkie for backup while sprinting further into Tobias Crenshaw's property. Backup needed immediately at Crenshaw's place, I gasped as I ran. In the distance, I saw Amber near one of our traps, a fallen log suspended above the ground by thick ropes. Seeing her brought me a new sense of urgency. We had to get this creature away from her. I needed to lead it away before it could harm her or anyone else in Madly. The creature lumbered after me, gaining quickly on my position. As it approached Amber and the trap she was near, I yelled at her to release it. She looked up and nodded, quickly slicing through the ropes just as the creature arrived below the log. 
With a sickening thud, it struck the creature right on its head. For a moment, it appeared to have worked. The creature toppled over onto its back. However, our hopes were quickly dashed when we saw how little damage had been inflicted upon it. With an enraged howl, it got back to its feet and started tearing away at the other traps placed nearby. We had little time to hide before we heard sirens in the distance. Backup was arriving. The mayor had dispatched police officers to our location after hearing my call on their walkie-talkies. They exited their cars and joined our frantic fight against the beast, each officer shooting at it with their weapons. Yet despite their efforts, it seemed that bullets did little to harm the creature. Tobias Crenshaw, a local farmer and friend of mine, emerged from his house carrying a large hunting rifle. He aimed it directly at the creature and fired, striking it in one of its large eyes. This time, the creature finally screamed in pain before retreating into the woods. We all stood in shock and relief as it disappeared from sight. Our town had survived an attack by a vicious, seemingly indestructible monster. The thought of Yolanda Parkins and others who hadn't been so lucky weighed heavily on us. As we stood there catching our breath, the mayor approached me to give his gratitude. Boone, he said solemnly, you did everything you could for this town, and we are grateful for your leadership. For now, our nightmare was over. But deep down we knew that this creature was still lurking somewhere out there, waiting, watching. Until we uncovered its origins or found a way to stop it permanently, Madly would never be truly safe again. In the coming days and weeks, we focused on rebuilding our town and remembering those we had lost to the monster's rampage. In my search for answers about its origins or possible weaknesses, I contacted experts in both animal behavior and cryptozoology all around the world. However, none of them had ever seen or heard of such a beast as this one. Though we don't know when or if it will return to Madly again, one thing remains clear. Our once peaceful town has changed forever. We have been irrevocably scarred by what happened here. And like the gnarled claw marks left on Tobias Crenshaw's property, these emotional scars will be with us always. We all must be extra vigilant, watching the shadows, staying on alert and preparing for the possibility that one day the creature might return. But despite our fears, one thing still rings true. We faced down a monster and emerged alive. The ties that bind us as a community have grown stronger because of it. So we move forward, ready to defend our town and the people we love. No matter what horrors may stalk us in our darkest hours, we stand strong together against them. I'm Officer Nate Gavinsky, a small-town cop from Crestview, located in the picturesque state of Oregon. While we usually dealt with minor incidents, today was different. My shift started like any other. I cracked a joke with my partner, Lucy York something about shoe detectives always being at the scene of the crime. She chuckled and joined me on our usual patrol through the town. While chatting through the radio, we received a call from dispatch, a missing person's case down by Craven River. Our light-hearted mood quickly evaporated. Upon arrival, we found frantic family members searching for their daughter. They told us Tori Calvert, a college student home for break, had gone jogging this morning but never returned. We immediately launched a thorough search along the riverbank and found a disturbing scene buried within ferns and brush. Tori's violently shredded clothing and her abandoned phone was smashed screen. Further examination of the area revealed unnerving sets of large claw marks on nearby trees that indicated something powerful and unusual was at play here. A daunting realization washed over me. 
we were dealing with something far more sinister than what our little town was accustomed to or prepared for. Lucy called for backup as we tried to calm Tori's friends and family. After taking statements and gathering evidence, detectives took over the scene while we stayed behind to investigate. While discussing potential leads with neighboring woods, we stumbled upon disturbing noises echoing from the dark forest. Cries of pain and fear perforated the air as an unbelievable creature emerged from behind thick foliage. A beast resembling an enormous wolf unfathomable for this region yet it stood on its hind legs like a human. Lucy instinctively drew her firearm as terror filled both of our eyes when it charged us with great speed and unmatched aggression. Before she could fire any shots, it tore through my partner's arm, leaving her unconscious and gravely injured. Backup lights flashed in the distance as the beast appeared to acknowledge the impending danger and retreated into the shadows. I desperately tried to stop the blood flow from Lucy's arm while calling for help over the radio. The responding officers found us, whisking her away to the hospital. As news spread about this monstrous creature, more stories of previous encounters began to surface from hesitant locals, detailing animal mutilations and other forest sightings. A horrifying pattern emerged which hinted at a possible connection to this terrible beast. This newfound realization shook our town's sense of safety and tranquility. At an emergency town meeting, I shared my own story, growing up fatherless after my dad had encountered a similar creature during a hiking trip years ago. My father was never seen again but I remained eternally grateful that he instilled in me a sense of duty and resilience in the face of fear. Determined to protect Crestview citizens, we organized search parties in an effort to hunt down the monster. We equipped ourselves with firearms and radios, exploring areas where it was frequently spotted lurking on its predatory hunts. During one late-night search near Craven River, I briefly saw its terrifying silhouette lurking on the outskirts of my flashlight range, illuminated by chilling moonlight before disappearing once again. The apprehensive whispers among our group grew louder, fueled by our mounting fear and uncertainty in confronting such terror. As we pressed on through dense foliage ahead, sounds of panic chatter echoed through our radios. Two more people had followed Tori's fate. Their disemboweled bodies were discovered under horrific circumstances behind their own homes as if taunted by this heinous creature. While knowing that our attacker was nearby, we cautiously progressed deeper into the forest, signing ourselves potentially up for death or worse. Our nerves on edge as uncertain shadows shifted around us under gnarled trees housing unseen terrors. Our breaths grew ragged and desperate. We heard the chilling howls in the distance, one of my fellow searchers cracking a nervous joke about bad karaoke. Even while under the threat of death, we managed to find solace and levity as bonds of camaraderie formed from shared experience. Then, as we trekked through the darkened woods with adrenaline coursing through our veins, the creature's blood-curdling roar pierced the otherwise quiet night. In an instant, it leapt towards us with wide vermilion eyes fixed upon its next victims. We had expected to defend our fellow townspeople, but now we fought for our lives. With the creature pouncing on us, we scurried in all directions, desperately trying to dodge its vicious attacks. The forest erupted into chaos people tripped on exposed roots. Branches cracked under the force of our retreat. I sprinted away, seeking refuge behind a large tree and tried to catch my breath. Remembering my radio, I fumbled with it and called for help. My voice trembled as I spoke. P please, someone respond. We need backup. That creature is attacking us. The static-filled response barely came through. Hold on. We're sending reinforcements. No sooner had I put the radio down than I heard a blood-curdling scream from my right. 
The creature had caught one of our searchers in an unrelenting grasp. I braced myself and rushed towards the poor man being dragged away by the creature. His body was enveloped by its grotesque form, dark, leathery skin stretched over a muscular frame, a snarling mouth filled with sharp teeth dripped saliva. Its hooked claws were deeply embedded in the man's flesh. Our eyes met fleetingly his widened in terror, mine stung as tears threatened to fall. We have to save him. A fellow searcher named Cindy yelled beside me. We shouted to rally our group and charged fearlessly towards the beast. The few flashlights still working cast eerie shadows upon its hideous features. Desperation seemed to grant us unnatural speed as we wanted so dearly to free our friend from that grotesque being's grasp. We grabbed at anything within our reach sticks or stones that were brutal enough to bash against or hurl at it with full force. Then the most dreaded sound emerged from the radio. Wait! Hold back! Our weapons aren't effective against this thing! But our roaring adrenaline deafened us to reason. Furiously, we beat and kicked and clawed against its terrifying presence only for our makeshift weapons to shatter into splinters like glass. Exasperated and overpowered, I glanced around helplessly, feeling defeated. I knew calling for reinforcements was the only logical choice. My finger quivered over the radio button as the creature, still clutching the man within its merciless claws, advanced towards me with pouncing desperation. The onslaught of reinforcements arrived in a thunderous storm of footsteps. Their heavy boots crashed upon earth, and their guns cut through the darkness with lethal lights. Yet even the searing impact of bullets couldn't hold back that monstrous being. They dragged the creatures captive away his muddied boots leaving streaks of red on damp earth behind them. Panting, I strained my eyes to see what became of our fellow searcher as that living nightmare spirited him away from our line of vision. The cacophony of roars receding into the night left an anguished echo in our hearts. Feigning valiance, we waited until dawn broke before returning to base empty-handed. We prepared solemnly to deliver the gruesome news of loss to whoever awaited back home. As much as we wanted to help Tori and now our fellow searcher, we feared for our lives. Upon reuniting closer to civilization, we hesitated to disclose any details regarding that ghastly creature's existence. We knew it would ignite untamable chaos in hearts already burdened with tragedy. We all agreed it was best if people never knew about this mysterious cryptid prowling their lands. During those uneasy coming days, we mourned our fallen brethren and planned quietly about how to watch over Craven River without drawing more people into harm's way. Soon word spread throughout town, whispers of a silent agreement amongst us searchers that no family deserved such heartache in these already dark times. We kept our suffering tightly bundled within so long as our town's children slept safely each night. As for the creature, it may hunt unseen by vulnerable prey, taunting us from those sinister shadows, but it would never claim victory over humans fighting for each other in camaraderie, bound together in light amid nature's darkness. I remember that day. The sun was beating down on me as I wiped the sweat from my brow. My name is Leland Masterson, and I'm a small-town cop in Stonebrook, Nevada, a quaint and picturesque town situated between two mountain ranges. Although it's not a tourist hotspot, it has a certain charm to it, with its small stores lining the main street and locals going about their daily lives without a care in the world. While I was patrolling the town, there had been reports of several missing persons within a month. Though it's not uncommon for drifters to pass through Stonebrick and disappear, this time was different. Entire families were reported missing from their homes with no signs of struggle or forced entry. 
As the tension in the town began to build, I grew more determined to uncover what was going on. During an investigation at one of the crime scenes, I couldn't help but notice an odd pattern. Each house where people had gone missing shared striking similarities with their surrounding environments. Curiously, overgrown foliage surrounded these houses, as though nature had clawed its way back into their lives. After filing my report, I talked to my partner, Odette Carver, over lunch about these strange occurrences. She chuckled and said, This could be Stonebrick's very own creature feature. Though amused by her humor, I couldn't shake my suspicion that something horrifying lurked in our seemingly innocent town. I decided to visit Helen Hawkins at the library for more information on any unusual events or history relating to Stonebrook. She searched through stacks of books but found nothing out of the ordinary. However, she mentioned that recent construction work near the mountains may have disturbed something hidden within them. As days went by and more people vanished, Odette and I conducted further investigations. One fateful afternoon, while inspecting another deserted house along with Officer Garrett Gilmore, we stumbled upon a hidden network of caves within the mountain's depths. We discussed whether the creatures had left any evidence but decided against calling for reinforcements, as we didn't want to create unnecessary panic in the town. The moment we stepped into the dimly lit cave, a foul stench enveloped us. Garrett, attempting to lighten our spirits, joked about how he should have brought along the plug-in air freshener he keeps in his patrol car. Descending deeper into the darkness with only our flashlights to guide us, a sense of dread enveloped me as thoughts from my past swirled around. The day I enlisted as a cop and the day I almost lost my life while disarming a bomb. No previous experiences compared to what lay ahead. We stumbled upon an open chamber with unsettling markings on the walls that were unlike anything I'd ever seen before. In the center of this chamber, we laid eyes upon piles of discarded clothing and shredded shoes scattered among massive nests of branches and leaves. Exploring further, we soon discovered cages constructed from twisted tree roots that housed what was once the missing townspeople, malnourished, their lifeless eyes staring back at us in terror. Panic began to set in, and I frantically fumbled with my gun, knowing our lives could be in danger as well. It wasn't long before we heard an otherworldly growl echo through the cave system. Not knowing where it came from or how many creatures there might be, we scrambled back towards the entrance. As adrenaline surged through my veins and fear intensified, Garrett muttered, This is worse than walking into my ex's family reunion. We all let out nervous laughter amidst our terror. Suddenly, behind one of the many larger rocks that surrounded us emerged a creature so grotesque and monstrous it defied all logic. The beast stood nearly eight feet tall with muscular limbs covered in thick matted fur. Horns protruded from its wide, skull-like head, and drool dripped from its mouth filled with jagged, razor-sharp teeth. But there was no time to take in the true horror of what faced us. Our instincts kicked in, and we started firing our guns at the monstrosity in hopes of either killing or driving it back. Unable to call for help and unsure whether our bullets were having any impact on this hideous beast plus, we braced ourselves for the showdown that would determine our survival. Bullets was past the creature, but it appeared unfazed. It snorted and charged towards us. We each scattered, seeking anything that could provide us cover from the monstrous being. I took refuge behind a pile of discarded clothes and yelled out to my friend Mary, who had climbed a nearby tree in her desperation. Mary! Can you call for help? My phone is back at camp! I shouted. I can't! My phone's with yours! Mary replied frantically as she tried to pull herself higher up in the tree. Garrett! using a broken branch as a makeshift spear, tried to fend off the beast. 
It was an apparent act of desperation, but one that would give me time to figure out a plan. Knowing we couldn't rely on our phones or weapons, I decided to focus on distraction and escape. Guys, we need to make a run for it. Try to confuse it and scatter. Just head for the cave entrance. I called out as loudly as I dared while the creature was momentarily preoccupied with Garrett's brave attempt at defense. We all bolted from our hiding spots, desperate to avoid being within striking distance of those deadly horns or teeth. However, that became increasingly difficult as more creatures just like the initial one entered from surrounding tunnels and joined the hunt. The cave transformed into a labyrinth of horrors, filled with gruesome creatures lunging at us from every direction. The putrid smell of blood mixed with the earthy scent of damp dirt made every breath feel like choking on tainted air. I stumbled upon Mary again in my frantic flight. Her clothes were torn, and she had deep scratches on her legs from close encounters with the beasts. Garrett was nowhere in sight, but we dared not call out his name for fear of attracting more attention to ourselves. It felt like hours had gone by, but in reality, it must have only been a few minutes before we spotted the faint sunlight filtering through the cave entrance. Gasping for breath, Mary and I made our final sprint for freedom hoping against hope that our tormentors were not closing in. We stumbled into daylight at last and fell to the ground, out of breath and minds racing with the traumatizing ordeal. There was no time to rest, though. We had to keep moving. Garrett was still missing, and we had to find help. On our way back to camp, we stumbled upon a bloodied figure limping towards us. It was Garrett battered and bruised but alive. We felt immense relief wash over us despite the nightmare we just endured. Upon reaching camp, we called for help from the authorities. With trembling voices, we recounted our experience within the caves the discovery of what seemed like an unknown species of monstrous creatures preying on human beings. The officials dispatched a team to handle the situation while they evacuated nearby townspeople. We couldn't shake the feeling that these creatures had been living beneath our lives all this time, hidden in darkness waiting to strike. Injured and terrified, we refused offers for medical attention until everyone was cleared out of danger's grasp. We huddled together by a campfire as more people arrived on scene, journalists, wildlife experts, even military personnel. As night descended and closing vehicles illuminated the area like daylight, we couldn't help but reflect upon what happened with our hearts heavy for those now gone, their gruesome demise painting a horrifying portrait within our memories that would forever be etched in our minds. Eventually, it was determined that some experimental animal hybrid had escaped from a nearby research facility years ago only to find sanctuary deep within those caves. A plausible answer or a cover-up? We will probably never know, nor do we want to explore any further. In those chaotic hours spent underground being hunted by primal horrors beyond comprehension, Mary, Garrett, and I formed a bond built upon the foundations of survival. Over time, we pushed away from the shadows that dwelled beneath our everyday lives, but we could never fully escape what we had seen. That ungodly growl still echoes through my dreams, a terrifying reminder of a villainous creature that lurked beneath the surface and the victims it cruelly conquered in the dark caverns. We can only hope that the nightmare we witnessed remains locked away deep within the earth, unable to harm anyone ever again. I'm Sergeant Patrick O'Malley from Morristown, New Jersey. It's a cozy little town where nothing bad seemed to happen. That is, until today. When I find myself making dumb jokes back at the station about crazy incidents, it's a normal day for me. But today there is no room for laughter. 
It all started with the 911 call. Someone found Elaine Preston lying on the floor of her bedroom, lifeless for everyone to see. She looked like one of those crime scene photos, her light brown hair scattered around her face, just as it had been that night. The poor thing seemed almost peaceful in death. If only she knew the terror that awaited outside her window. Immediately, my partner and I drove to the crime scene. As we searched for clues, we encountered an array of curious neighbors huddled together in fear. It wasn't their fault. They were scared stiff like gazelles in headlights. Everyone's eyes seemed fixated on Elaine's house as curiosity seeped into their expressions. Investigating further into the night, I soon discovered that there were no signs of forced entry and no valuables missing from Elaine's home. It was baffling. In that moment, Dave Walker approached me hesitantly. He stammered as he explained how he heard unusual sounds outside his house about an hour ago, but, thinking it was just some raccoon rummaging through the trash, he didn't bother calling anyone. With his testimony fresh in my mind and adrenaline pumping through my veins like a wildfire, I ventured outside to investigate this so-called raccoon. As I peered into the darkness beyond the edge of my flashlight beam, I suddenly spotted something moving not too far away in the distance. It moved with shocking speed and agility, nothing like any wildlife we've seen around here before. Even more puzzling were its claw-like hands and powerful hind legs. Its body looked almost familiar, yet entirely unrecognizable. The creature then disappeared into the shadows, leaving me petrified and perplexed. Something didn't feel right, as if we had just stumbled upon a grotesque secret hidden behind the curtain of night. I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't dealing with your average small-town thievery anymore. I had Dave get in touch with whoever would be able to help us understand what was happening. The next day, we spoke to Greta Jones, an old lady who claimed to have studied local fauna for decades. After showing her footage from my hidden dash cam, she seemed just as confused as we were. Fascinated and horrified by the creature's actions, Greta and her friend in pain agreed to take me deep into the nearby forest later that evening to search for clues about its whereabouts. At this point, we knew we couldn't risk calling more people and causing panic within the community. As night fell and with flashlights in hand, we ventured forth. We were met with eerie silence and thick darkness blanketing everything in sight. With every step taken deeper into the abyss-like forest, it felt like an unknown dread awaited around every corner. Unfortunately, despite our efforts, we found no trace of the mysterious creature that night. With sleep-deprived minds and nervous hearts weighing heavy on us all, we returned to town only to encounter a gruesome sight before us. Two of our fellow officers lay mutilated on the sidewalk, their throats ripped open in ways unimaginable. I couldn't contain my shock at witnessing such horror firsthand. Desperation took over me. I knew I needed to do something, anything, before this beast claimed more victims in its vicious spree of terror. As fear pulsed through my body like venom coursing through veins after a snake bite, I set out on my own towards the forest edge once more. I raced through the underbrush, hoping against hope that I would discover something, anything, to put a stop to this nightmare. But as the trees around me seemed to encroach closer together with each passing second and my breathing grew more labored, panic started to bubble within me. I felt insignificant and utterly powerless as I ventured deeper into the unknowable darkness. I called out to my fellow officers, but a crippling realization set and we didn't bring our phones to avoid drawing attention and panic. I shuddered, feeling vulnerable and cornered. We had wandered too deep into the forest, making it difficult for anyone to find us or hear our cries for help. The next day, 
with urgency and terror fueling their every move, the remaining officers and I met secretly to discuss potential explanations for the creature and to formulate a plan of action. However, our conversation only led us in circles. We knew nothing about the beast apart from its monstrous appearance. One officer suggested consulting a cryptozoologist they had heard of through the grapevine. With no other options on the table, we agreed to bring him in for questioning at our next clandestine meeting. As we waited for him to arrive, whispers and accusations flew between fellow officers. Paranoia gripped everyone. Anyone could be an informant or accessory to this terror. Our town anxiously awaited its next move. Nobody knew when or where it would strike again. When the expert arrived, he was incredibly knowledgeable about all things creatures related but just as baffled as us when it came to pinpointing this particular adversary. With furrowed brows and nerves on edge, we soaked in every bit of information he had to offer about various animal behaviors and known predators. Even though we couldn't identify the origin of this menace, any insight that could give us an edge seemed priceless. As night fell again, we separated to monitor different points around town, patrolling in pairs to ensure no one was left alone with the creature. Despite being unable to call for help, at least two heads could possibly be better than one upon encountering the monster. Hours trickled past with no sightings or disturbances. Our town seemed an eerily quiet ghost town as its residents barricaded themselves indoors. As we collectively held our breaths in anticipation, a sudden and ferocious scream pierced the air, followed by a gut-wrenching sound of flesh tearing. Without a moment to spare, we rushed towards the source, flashlights waving wildly in every direction. We arrived too late. Another officer was in the clutches of an enormous creature with matted dark fur and claws sinking into its flesh. Its predatory eyes bore into ours as though daring us to make our next move. Despite our desperation, there was no way to save our fellow man. The creature made sure of that. As quickly as it appeared, it vanished into the night, leaving gruesome evidence systematically ripped apart before us. In the aftermath of this chaos, we reached a unanimous agreement. Our only option left was to leave town entirely. Ultimately, no one could feel safe until secrets were revealed about what lurked within the shadows. With heavy hearts, we packed up our belongings and left behind everything we had known with no plans of returning. It wasn't just fear that drove us away. It was a sense of helplessness and powerlessness against an unknown entity incapable of being caught or understood. While driving away from my now-abandoned hometown, I stared out at the forest as fields gave way to hustle and bustle further along. I believe deep down that we never uncover what led this nightmare to descend upon our quiet community, or what would now befall it in our absence. Though we escaped physically intact, memories of that beast will forever haunt my dreams, a ghastly testament to the fact that sometimes all you can do is walk away and accept defeat when confronted with unimaginable terror. We may never know its motives or origins, but taking care of each other became paramount in final moments spent together while mourning those who paid the ultimate price in proximity to this merciless predator.